stupid. He comes across in front of me every single time he overtakes. Where does he want me to go off the track? No! Stop talking to me in the braking zone! We're 75 down, and somehow we're still hot enough to heat this diamond. Welcome back to Motorsport 101. To correct you, we're, we're 74 down, not 75. We haven't actually, you know, did the 75th episode yet. Welcome to the 25th anniversary of WrestleMania. <laughs> <laughs> Andre, you're a bastard. I hate all of you right now. Oh my god. We love you too, Dre! Welcome to WrestleMania Play Icon. <laughs> Yes, yes, you guys win. You guys win. <laughs> Welcome to episode 75 of the Motorsport 101 podcast. I'm your friendly neighborhood host, Mr. Andre Harrison. And, uh, whew, big week of the podcast ahead for us, folks. Big, big week for us. And, uh, yeah, we've actually got a fearsome foursome with us on this episode of the podcast to celebrate 75 episodes, the diamond, so to speak. Uh, I want all the diamond glitter on our on our episode thumbnail for this king. Do you, do you understand? <laughs> sure, sure, I'll, I'll I'll do my best. Yes, King is here uh, as always. He's he's doing good, I'm sure. Joining us again, Mr. RJ O'Connell. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, it's lovely out. It's surprising change of pace. It's about 61 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Um, it's t-shirt weather in the middle of February. This feels weird. Very weird. Like I said, like, I, I, I mentioned this before we went on the air. Like it's been actually like fourteen, fifteen degrees Celsius in London the last couple of days. I've actually turned the radiator down for the first time in like three months. It's very nice. I can get used to this. You know, it's not a good start when we're talking about the weather. That's like the definition of the bottom of the barrel of small talk. <laughs> but uh, speaking of which, we have another special guest with us on this one, making I want to say his third appearance on the show now. Yes, actually, third. Ball, I think. Third, yes. Third, yep. He is the host of Mystery Science Theatre F1. He has a bajillion YouTube subscribers already. <laughs> I think he's going to get a silver play badge sometime next year. Suck it, Arav! Um, in the meantime... <laughs> Whoa, big <and> claim. <laughs> yeah, big claim. But uh, yeah, he's the host of MST F1 and now the Cook and Conero podcast. Yes, he's joined us. He's joined the fraternity of podcasters. And then he gets downhill from here, I, I tell you. It's Matt Conero, everybody. Hello, Matt. Nice to see you, sir. Hello, Dre. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to complete the Four Horsemen. I was called under special request here. Over here, the weather is about 27 degrees Celsius. I came home from college dripping in sweat. And so so <laughs> thankfully, I had some time to recover before recording this. But anyway, I'm glad to be joining here, joining you again for the third time now. It's a very, very yeah. welcoming place. I like it. In, in, in true Soccer AM fashion, your hat trick ball is is in the post as we speak. And uh, <laughs> 27, deg- 27 degrees in Brazil and dripping in sweat, ladies. He's, he, <laughs> <laughs> he is single. He's single. <laughs> he is indeed. More on that later. But uh, before we really get going into the show, you probably have heard of this by now, but Bike Live has joined the Motorsport 101 network. Yeah! yeah. We're officially up and running now. Like by the time you listen to this episode, our first Bike Live episode of Season 4 and basically the dawn of a new era. Um, it's the Force Awakens of motorsport podcasts, really. Um, just minus any really cool co-hosts, except for me. And hey, Chris. hey, hey. <laughs> At least we didn't have a terrible invasion angle. That is true. That is true. That can still be arranged. <laughs> oh, God, mostly no. Be, please please mostly, don't book, like, me getting hit with a steel chair by Bex or anything, because that would be terrible. <laughs> Damn it. New plan. New plan. <laughs> He's on to us. I'm going um, to inject no, M101 with a poison. <laughs> <laughs> you got you got to hit it with like you got to hit it with like the like the back of your, you're gonna just cop up all the phlegm and you hit that line like i'm going to inject <laughs> that's the best part of that damn promo oh yeah very very, very true but um yeah bike live is now live on the motors but one on the network you guys don't have to do anything at all it will be on the exact same feed you're listening to us on so if you listen to us on itunes soundcloud tune in Stitcher, you name it, it'll be on there automatically. 
just stick around and listen to the show. It's me and Lewis this, uh, to our first episode this time round. Bex was stuck in pub hell. We'll fish her out eventually, we promise, uh, at some point. But uh, we preview World Superbikes for 2017. Great big season preview, nearly two hours long, featuring all the teams from Jonathan Ray uh, and the Kawasaki boys, Tom Sykes, Ducati, Kawasaki, the newer, prettier boys, Yamaha with Vandermark. It goes on and on and on. And we had not one, but two interviews. The first two interviews in the history of our network, which is very, very cool to say. Something we've been meaning to do for a long time, but we never quite got round to it. But uh, we've got two interviews. We've got Gregory Haynes, the voice of, of World Superbikes now on British Eurosport. Thank God they're still on Sky. Um, and, and we were able to save Eurosport, which is very nice indeed. So Greg Haynes is on the show. We had a proper half an hour long interview with him. One of the best interviews we've ever done. I think he was he's a fantastic, fantastic guy to have on the show. And we got an exclusive chat with Chaz Davis who's in Australia as we speak, setting up for the first race of the season this weekend, uh, representing Aruba Ducati, a, a perennial title contender, and definitely gunning for the title this year alongside Marco Melandri. So check it out if you haven't already. Uh, please listen and support the show. We've had to work so hard to get those boys over, and trust me, take it from me, I'm so glad we got them on the side of the network. And, uh, and for those that are fans of the original Bike Live, keep an eye on the first three minutes. Uh, my co-host fires some shots. That's all I will say. <laughs> but, uh, but, oh, God. Uh, not, like, wh- when this episode comes out, I probably would have listened to it by now, but yeah, I haven't listened to it at the moment of recording, and now, God damn it, I want to Oh, yeah, I got to I gotta seek it out, too. That's, that's just, that just got me hooked. <laughs> mm. <laughs> First three minutes. First three minutes of the show. That's all, that's all I will say. But um, it's 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 a funny one. Trust me. Um, <laughs> I, I bet he laughed. I, I, I can't remember the last time I laughed so hard on an episode of The Bike Live when Lewis came out with that line. You'll know what I'm talking about when you listen to it. But in the meantime, all the places you can find us on social media. We are at motorsport101.net as our website. You can find all of us on there. Also, our social media, we are on facebook.com forward slash motorsport101. We are on Twitter at motorsport underscore. 101 legal rambling still going on with the guy that owns the proper name unfortunately and we're on youtube.com forward slash motorsport 101 we are finishing off the season reviews this week we are very nearly there just three more to upload ferrari will be out probably by the time we listen to this or i think it's on wednesday the 22nd i set that up for so we'll definitely have at least one more by the time you listen to this show probably maybe even two so we're going to finish that off this week hopefully and uh, we can start moving on to more highlights and other projects and all sorts of funny stuff i've got a ride to drave you in the in the works as well i'm writing that script as we speak and if you really really like us you can back us on patreon at patreon.com forward slash most 101 and to clarify because a couple of people have asked me about this and 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 uh, sent messages and emails and whatnot you do get both shows on early access if you are a five dollar backer. So don't think we're carve we're, we're siphoning off content. If it's we we treat both shows the same. So if you are an early access backer for the podcast, you get it for not only motorsport one but for bike live as well. So there's never been a better time to be a Patreon backer. Just throwing that out there. But um, that will just about do it for that. Oh, on our, by the way, our personal Twitter, if you haven't already, Harrison101HD, at Ryan Eric King, at RJ O'Connell, and at Scanning Tour, I believe it is, Matt. Yes, that's right. That's, that's right. Yep, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. It's hard to get that one right sometimes. <laughs> I, keep, I, keep, I keep thinking of He Man. It's not a good idea. Um, <laughs> but in the meantime, let's crack cracking with the show, and it is an absolutely loaded Keeping It 101 segment this time around. <laughs> We thought to celebrate our 75th anniversary of Motorsport 101, we will do what we do best on this show, and that's not talk about motorsports. Uh, because we are so good at that. But um, there was a big one that came out at the time of recording for Monday, and it resonated quite personally with a certain co-host on this show, and that is RJ O'Connell. So, my good friend, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, this is, again, this is something that just came out on... Monday, uh, February the 20th, the day that we recorded this episode, and um, when it was something that I wanted to talk about, and Lord knows I'm probably going to not do this all the justice that it deserves, because when I, even when I talk about something that I know a lot about and I'm very passionate about, I tend to ramble and fly off the handle a lot, um, so that may become the case. Um, 
Danny Watts, professional racing driver with over 20 years experience, um, former Le Mans LMP2 class winner, uh, came out today to the public and said that he is homosexual. He is the highest profile racing driver from Europe to come out to the public so far. Um, he talked with Matt Beer of Autosport.com and also with Matt Fernandez of DailySportsCar.com. Both uh, both interviews are very, very much worth the read. And mm-hmm. Danny, K- Danny Watts is not somebody who's like a household name in motorsport, not on the level of like a Lewis Hamilton or a Valentino Rossi like that. But over his 20 years of work, he's put in solid work. Like anybody who is a diehard fan of motorsport, particularly sports car and endurance racing, knows what Danny Watts can bring to the table. He is a former Formula Renault UK champion. He has won races in British Formula 3. He has stood on podiums in events like Porsche Super Cup and raced in A1GP against the likes of Neil Yanni and Marco Andretti, Felipe Albuquerque, and Loic Duval, just to name a few. Um, he's best known for his time in LMP2 with the Straka Racing Team and the all-British lineup of himself, Nick Leventis, and Johnny Kane, who won their class in 2010 and actually raced together for like the last seven years in a row. It was Kane, Watts, and Leventis for Straka Racing. Um, this past year at Le Mans was his last um, competitive outing. He's since... He's retired from racing, but he is still very much involved in motorsport because he will be the driver coach for High Tech GP in the European F3 Championship. So it is good to see that he's still involved in racing. But the big story is obviously, of course, the fact that he is coming out. It's it's a big deal. It's a very big deal because it is something that is so very rare in a sport that I've always believed that motorsport is something where things like race, things like gender identity, things like sexual orientation should not matter in terms of whether or not a driver is successful or not. I I feel, I firmly feel like every driver who has the ability to drive a car fast and win races should get the opportunities that they deserve. But the reality is we know that that's not always the case. It's not always the case that the most talented drivers ever make it out of karting. And in the case of Danny Watts, he was very upfront in both of his interviews with Autosport and with Daily Sports Car about how much uh, how much fear he had about the process of coming out, even after he had retired from driving, um, that he was still very anxious about how people would see him. And I'll quote from Danny Watts directly from his interview with with uh, Matt Beer of Autosport and by extension Motorsport.com. He says, "You you feel like you have to hide it within motorsport because it's a very masculine sport." I told close family members and friends. There was obviously some shock to start off with, but people were also very supportive, which was nice. So I thought if they're cool with it, let's go with it. He said he'd he'd admitted that making the announcement felt easier now that he stopped racing, as his biggest concern was about how sponsors and teams might react. Watts says, the biggest thing is worrying about what people will think and how they'll portray you and how they'll act around you. It's stupid things like thinking, do I go and shake hands with people? Will they shake your hand back? Am I going to be able to look them in the eye or not? Is it going to be awkward? There are a million and one questions going around in my head about how this is all going to work out. My stomach is churning about the next paddock I go to and people knowing and how they'll think of me. It's bloody scary. He described recent months as horrible and explained he decided to make a public announcement would be healthier than only informing the people close to him. He says, you can either keep it a secret in racing and have your separate life where your close friends and family know, or you can just go all out and say, there you go, my cards are out on the table, take it or leave it. Um, But I also appreciate the editorial that Mr. Matt Beer added to his his Mm -hmm. interview, um, which, and I will quote some of the most important parts and some of them that I really feel are pertinent, that... He says that some people might feel that we're wrong to write about a driver's sexuality, that this is a private life detail irrelevant to our motorsport remit. And indeed, Autosport, some people had already reported that people have been sending in some terrible takes about how, well, why don't you make make a big story about how a driver is heterosexual? Like, you're missing the point and you're part of the problem. Um... But there is a big difference between someone preferring to keep their personal life out of the spotlight and someone feeling like they have absolutely no choice but to keep their personal life completely private from their sport because the alternative is terrifying. 
Um, we know, and we have had lots of frank discussions on this podcast, on social media, between ourselves about how hyper masculine and kind of bullshit that is that motorsports is sometimes between grid girls, between the between the sort of toxic fan base of between how kind of toxic fans are and treating people of different um, treating women in motorsport treating people of different racial backgrounds, treating people of different sexual orientations, you know, that, that all exists in motorsport. And thank goodness that, you know, for the most part, people have been very receptive to Danny Watts coming out today, which I am very proud of. Mm -hmm. I understand that there are very much pockets of, you know, resistance or people saying, well, I don't really care about this, which I think, you know, in my time, I've always found that people go out of their way to say, well, I don't care about this. I think they're really just trying to project something that they they want to say something that's like more outwardly hateful, but they don't want to actually get called out on being an asshole. So they'll just pass it off as ignorance or apathy. Um, that's what I've mm-hmm. that's how I usually see things. But I think the quote from Matt Beer that really hits it on the head is that no one should have to feel what Danny has in recent months. And hopefully the motorsport world will react in a way that shows that he needn't have been so scared and that others having the same struggles won't have to. There's enough competitive and financial pressure on young racers without them having to fear their own identity. And, you know, I will say this. I'll say this. I believe that, you know, a lot of the problem of why we don't see athletes and racing drivers come out is because of that pressure from the sponsors, you know, because what happens if you're, if you're backed by uh, if you're backed by a company that has a much different belief set than you do, they'd be more than willing to just cut the legs from right out under your sponsorship program, and then you're done racing, which is which is not very fair. Motorsports' conscious decision to make heterosexuality part of its appeal doesn't help in this regard either. There are still FIA-sanctioned world championships that feel a race cannot start without heavily reinforced cleavage displays on its grid. That issue is a whole separate minefield for another day, but its implication is that this is what appeals to a racing driver or fans' desires has consequences. It is statistically ludicrous to think that only heterosexual white males can be any good at driving fast, or that only heterosexual white males would enjoy watching people drive fast. And you don't just have to look at the panel of the people that we have on our show today. Um, you can just look in any crowd in motorsport, whether that be in the stands or talking about it on social media. Um, we're a diverse crowd of people who love motorsport. Um, gender and ethnicity are not the barriers to motorsport success and enjoyment that they once implicitly appear to be. And sexuality should not be either. I, com- I completely agree and endorse. And, you know, I think from listening to what Danny had said, it unfortunately also... Um, reaffirm my fears about how you know the motorsport community can be in terms of being very regressive minded very hyper masculine to the point that it's completely toxic and that that ultimately drives people away from coming out and being true to themselves you know i i'm openly bisexual and i have very Mm. few people that i can look up to in the motorsport community whether they are drivers or engineers or commentators what have you um because I feel like, because I know that a lot of them feel like they cannot come out, that this space is not safe for them to do so. Um, I mean, before there was Danny Watts, you could probably count the number of active LGBTQA drivers on one hand. I remember Mike Vershoor. Mike Vershoor won the um, the 2009 Renault Sport Trophy. In 2011, he openly came out, and he was probably the first homosexual driver on record racing in Europe. In 2013, he nearly won his second title in that championship as an openly out racing driver, but he has not been racing very competitively in the last three years, and in fact, he made a one-off appearance at the Renault Sport Trophy event in Paul Ricard. Nobody really paid much mind to it. If you look back in the history books, you will know that there are instances of LGBTQA drivers who have raced before. There is Michelle Duff, who was a factory racing driver, racing rider for Yamaha in the 1960s in MotoGP. Um, there was, or was my goodness, Mike Butler, who was an F1 privateer, only ran a few races, but is still is still considered the first and only out F1 driver, but very little known even after he'd passed away from AIDS in the late 80s or early 90s. I'm not entirely sure. 
it's kind of telling that really the most um, the most prominent LGBTQA driver that most people will probably know of, but not as a racing driver. Caitlyn Jenner was a multi-time race winner in IMSA yeah. GTO back in the 80s, and unfortunately, she's not carried herself very well as a role model to the LGBTQA community um, in recent years. But that is an entirely different issue for another day. I, I'll tell you what, I'm I'm very proud of Danny Watts for coming out. I feel like I have somebody to look up to um, as as a driver and as a role model, and hopefully, other people in motorsport who feel like they don't. They don't belong because of their sexual orientation or because of their gender identity or what have you. Um, I hope that they, this can that this can be a start of something to help them feel more invited. But I mean, I've got to be honest as well. There's also more work that needs to be done. We need to tear down a lot of the social barriers, and we we also need to make the distinction that you know. I don't think we should get to a point where this should just be an irrelevant part of somebody's life because. Danny Watts being a gay driver, it should absolutely be a part of his identity. Like that is something to be to be celebrated, just mm-hmm. like we should celebrate the fact that Lewis Hamilton, Pascal Verlaine, and Jan Mardenborough and Daryl Wallace are black drivers uh, having success in a field of sport that is not um, that is predominantly white. Um, that we should celebrate the successes of drivers like Danica Patrick and Simona De Silvestro in an entirely male dominated field. Um, we should celebrate the successes that drivers like Danny Watts have. And hopefully, if there is somebody that wants to come out on their terms, that does not feel like they need to owe anything to anybody else, that they want to come out as an openly out and active driver, that we should celebrate their success as well. Um, we should make the distinction between between wanting to just completely ignore this detail about it life, or we can embrace it, but understand that it should not affect how they are able to have a career in motorsport, whether or not they're able to get rides or not, or sponsorship, or work well with teams and other drivers. And I, I'm i very proud of most, I will not say all, because I know there have been people that have kind of had their bad takes about it, but I am very proud that most of the community has come out and embraced Danny Watts for who he is, and are working towards just trying to make this a better place for us all. Um, like I said, I have very people, few people like myself to look up to. Um, my goodness, I, it's, it was, it was very, it was something that I wasn't expecting this morning. But I'm very proud that it happened today, and I'm very proud to say that I've, I've got a new hero in Danny Watts. And you know, I'm very much glad to see how he works with the high tech GP team as well this season. And, you know, even though he says he's retired, I would not be surprised if he eventually got another drive down the road. If if the way that the motorsport community has reacted to his coming out is any indication. Um, I had a lot of things to say about this. I think um, I, I want to just ask if anybody else has any opinions on this, because I I know I had a lot of stuff to say. And I know maybe I didn't put it out in words the way that I thought I would have. But this was very important to me, and I'm very glad that this happened. First of all, thank you, RJ, and you know I know that I know that means a lot to you, um, given your position, given your status in life, and as a motorsport fan, and as a and as a bisexual male, um, that that couldn't have been it can't be an easy environment to be a part of sometimes. But um, I I I can only echo. The sentiments made by RJ and and others. I mean, I said it on Twitter when it, when the news came out. I said it says it's a sad state for the industry that Danny felt like he couldn't really come out and say something like that while he was still competing. And it, it's come out now. He's moved on with the next chapter of his life, and I think that's to a degree very sad because the support of I think of today has shown that I think it could have been possible to to have, have raced on in comfortable in his skin because again the reception I think has been largely very positive. I did get a couple of people on Twitter telling me that oh it's, this shouldn't be a big deal, this shouldn't be a story and you know yeah, in a in a perfect world, absolutely. I completely agree that it shouldn't be a story. But that again, that is a part of who Danny is as a human being and uh, it saddens me that someone feels like they can't be truly comfortable in their own skin because of their occupation 
and that should never be a thing in any walk of life in any job any any career like this it should not be a thing and I, I, I hope I hope I, I hope Danny's at peace, and I, I'd like to think that he is after coming out and, and saying this again. Props to Matt on Auto Sport for adding his extra two cents. I think it was definitely necessary and something that was well worth adding to provide extra context. Because let's be real here, I bet there was a good few people who read that and thought, "Well, why is Auto Sport posting this?" And again, that's disappointing, but I can't say it's unexpected given the space that we're in. I mean. I've made many a video talking about grid girls and and talking about the you know, the hyper hyper male masculine nature of the motorsport industry and the compromising effect it has on women and people of the LBGTQA community because let's be real here it's it's a man's sport and that's how it's been for decades if not hundreds of years or uh, the hundred plus years of the history of motorsport so to speak so we got a ways to go yet i think is i think that's fair to say but um we got to start yeah. somewhere uh, right and it, it really all goes back to maybe some preconceived notions from childhood that being into things like cars being into things like racing or sports that it's all just guy stuff you know absolutely. it's only for uh, only yeah. for only for the most macho of guys and mm-hmm. boys out there it's it's just a boys club and you know we have all these notions about how we want racing to go back to the way it was in the ultra macho uh, days of the 70s when really that's ugh, not necessarily no. the case and i've and i've trust me i've i've dealt with enough um first hand experience of just some of the more hateful um parts of the motorsport community to say the least mm. and I'm, you know, maybe in a past life I would have fallen down that road, or maybe in an alternate universe. But I'm I'm pretty glad that I didn't, and I'm pretty I'm pretty glad to, that I'm comfortable who I am, and in in turn I'm glad that Danny is comfortable in who he is. Absolutely. Um, it's man, it it's heavy, but I I'm just wow, oh, I'm. Goodness, I'm, I'm full of I'm full even even today I was like, am I sure I'm going to be able to put this out in words? I'd like to think you did a pretty damn good job, RJ. And if anyone out there that's listening to this show disagrees, I don't think this is the show for you. I'm just going to say that with a heavy heart and just going to be honest on that one because cause this segues in quite nicely into what I was going to say. And, you know, I, uh, I, I, my, I've put my email out there on the show. It's straight at motorsport101.net. It's on the website. It's on my social media. You can find it. You can email the show. And I I get tons of feedback. I do. And a lot of it is positive. And those who take the time out, thank you. It's really, it's really, really appreciative. And, I, and it, it does mean a lot. I got a couple of not so happy emails and comments regarding last our uh, last show two weeks ago um regarding the super bowl discussion not so much the super bowl itself you guys seem to really like that and I'm, I'm glad you guys did but people mentioned i was overreacting when talking about the new england patriots and some of their political affiliations from some of their key players like robert Kraft, the owner um bill belichick the head coach and tom brady their starting quarterback who are all friends of donald trump and We've never really discussed Trump on a large level um, on this podcast, mostly via just timing and dumb luck, really. Um, but I, 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 the emails in question were basically can be summed down to the now infamous hashtag going around on social media known as "stick to sports" and stick to what you're doing, and you know, stay in your lane, basically, and you get the gist and. What I will say is is that, no, I'm sorry, I'm taking a stand on this one. I refuse to stick to sports, and I'd argue that in today's climate, it's near impossible to do that now. I mean, I don't think anybody can understand just how conflicted I was about this Super Bowl just two weeks ago, knowing that the New England Patriots' three most prominent figures are getting into bed with Donald Trump and Tom Brady puts a Make America Great Again cap in his locker room and then tries to deflect all criticism or any questions about his affiliation or friendship with him and then acting like, oh, I don't know what's going on in the world. Look at me, I'm being naive and you're a grown man of 38 who I'm sure has their finger on the pulse enough to know what's going on in this world. And that that annoyed me and I, 
I straight up considered whether I still want to actively support this team for that very reason. Sticking to sports is impossible in today's climate. I mean, look, you're listening to what is essentially a Formula One podcast where most of the interesting stuff is politics anyway. Right. We d- Formula One and politics are so intertwined with each other and have been since almost going back to the pre championship era. Yeah, exactly. And most of the juicy stuff we talk about on just on podcasts like this is politics. Like we don't normally talk about the on track action because let's be real here, it's mostly stunk for the last two or three years. We've had a dominant team, we've had a lack of real storylines apart from us ripping apart how shit Ferrari were last year. And that annoys me like the like i'm sorry if you guys do not like the fact that i am willing to openly discuss things that aren't necessarily motorsport related and my response to that is is that there's a hundred shows like us out there on the internet that you could listen to and a lot of them will provide a lot of similar points and coverage because they're covering whatever sport they want to get into or motorsport or whatever formula one moto gp indycar imsa you name it um, I like to think you listen to this show because of us, who we are as people, what makes us tick, our personalities, because, heck, if it wasn't for that, why would you listen to us, really? Because that anybody else can do all sorts of things by, you know, repeating what happened in the Grand Prix. Like, I'd like to think that part of the reason you listen to us is because of who we are as people, and I take pride in that, and I take pride of who I am, I take pride in the people I'm very fortunate to be able to work with on this show, I'm incredibly proud to have worked with Ryan King on po- on, on projects for, god how long has it been now King, five, five years or so yeah, now? almost five years I'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> and 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 and, and like I said I'm, I'm proud to have worked with a guy like Ryan and to be able to call him a friend I'm proud I've met RJ who's added so much to the show in less than the year he's been on the show and you know provides cultural and sociological aspects that me and me and Ryan can't relate to and as well as guys like Matt like Chris like Sarah like other people that have contributed to the show on and off other people on social media like Sarah like Lizzie like Catherine, like you, you people out there who we always talk to, you know who you are. And I I take pride in being able to run a podcast where we don't stick to sports, where we are not going to ignore the elephants in the room. We've covered some topics on this show that many shows would not touch. Sexual assault, harassment, death. You know, it's things that many people would dance around. And... We like to think we're good at having these conversations and we can tackle these things. And I don't want anyone to come on this show and act like they can't speak their mind or they can't provide their takes or be honest with themselves or talk about things that maybe aren't necessarily motorsport related but makes the show tick and cover who we are as people. And if that's not the show for you and you want us to stick to sports, then I'm sorry. This is probably, again, this is not going to be the show for you. And that's okay. I, I, I'm not going to hold that against you personally, and I'm sorry if that's if that disappoints you. But again, I like to think who we are as guys makes this show tick, and that's what I think the part of the magic and the beauty of this show, and that is what I take the most pride in in being able to run this show. So sticking to sports is not my thing, and there's, it's a big wide world out there, and motorsport is just a very very small part of that and if you want to get out of that and you know you see, you see sports is a pleasant distraction the best way of doing that is probably getting on a rocket and flying to the moon right now because that's probably the best way of avoiding that right now but uh i'm gonna lighten the mood a little bit after that <laughs> because mm. i think we need to because boy it's been a thanks appreciate that <laughs> well, well i let me just drop one fact that actually surprised me a little bit because okay. i know i think back uh, during one of the Bahrain Grand Prix episodes, I talked about like how, you know, certain things are legal in Bahrain. <laughs> yes, and, yeah. um... and how <clears throat> uh, essentially like human rights is not a thing in Bahrain. And I was essentially I was surprised by looking up what countries F one goes to where homosexuality <clears throat> is punishable by law. And it's only three. Yeah. It's only three on the calendar right now. Unfortunately, that's probably still three too many. Yeah, but three, still, it is three too many. Yeah, and and if you've if you've kept up 
with the way the political climate is in the United States, we're almost venturing towards a fourth with the way that some states have, mm. um, have put in discriminatory bills through their House and Senate and ultimately in the legislation, North Carolina being the most yeah. prominent yeah, of them, the Indiana bill. among them. I mean, my goodness. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're talking about Bahrain, a country that only gave women the vote in 2003. That should tell you all. But, you know, we dance over things like that to cover motorsport. And I don't think they should be ignored. And that's always the way that I've looked at things because I like to look at the bigger picture with these things. And I'm more than willing to start the conversation if nobody else will. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for the time being. Because, again, this is we're normally a lot happier than this, but sometimes we have to be serious. And I don't like it, but if I'm, af- I'm afraid it has to be done sometimes. So I'm going to lighten the mood a little bit here. And I don't, the funny thing is, because Ryan King, I don't think he doesn't know this story. But, um... Because we kind of talked about this when the Olympics rolled around a little bit. And they're going to mention it again. King, you didn't see this news about Eugenie Bouchard? Oh, I... Oh. No? Oh, that story? Really? Yeah, I heard about it. Where's King gone? King. I, th- I, th- I think King he's, is, try- King he's trying to think it over. Like, did I... Did I really see this? <laughs> he's, re- he's trying to really... <laughs> try to uh, search it in his mind. <laughs> oh, hold on. Hold on. Because, yeah. This, yeah. this yeah. needs some expedition. Because yeah, that's, that's like cause that's one of King's favorite tennis players right there as well. And I'm, <laughs> I'm stunned if he didn't hear this story. Oh, oh, I heard about the story. The way you framed it and the way you made it sound so vague, it made it seem like it was closer. It, it wasn't like a national news story. It made it seem like a community news story. Oh, no, 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 no. You, 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 you were actually overthinking this one, bless you. Um, you. You give me too much credit, King, I have to, I have to, I have to be said. But... Uh, Shout out to the guy that called out Eugenie Bouchard during the Super Bowl and said, hey, if the Patriots come back from 25 points down, would you go out on a date with me? And then Eugenie was like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? We all, we all talked about it on the, last, on the show two weeks ago. The Patriots did come back and go on to win said Super Bowl. And Jeannie's response on Twitter was, okay, so where do you live? <laughs> uh, and as uh, and pff, again, props to her. She was a she was a girl of her word. Um, she went all the way to Brooklyn, New York, and took the guy in question to the Brooklyn Nets game the other day, which is almost like a sad case of masochism, given they're still in single digit wins for the NBA this season. I was like, I don't know why. Now hold now hold on. Um, yeah. <laughs> who are the who are the Nets playing? Because it may have just been a case of who are, who's coming into town to beat up the Brooklyn Nets. Hang on a minute. I'm gonna I'm gonna Google this up. I'm gonna find because it's it. just like because it's just like when you're a fan of a team that is uh, pretty bad and you have season tickets. Really, the attraction is just to see who's coming in town, not yeah. necessarily for the garbage team. Hang on, I'm gonna find it. It was they lost one twenty nine to one twenty five to the Milwaukee Bucks. Oh, so Ooh. yeah, that, that's, mm. a, that's a well, you got a you got a barn burner out of it. Yeah, that's yeah, a, you got a high scoring <laughs> game. I'll give them that. But uh, yeah, like I said, she was on Snapchat. She was she was posting snaps during during the show. She was on the halftime. I was begging Brooklyn put her on the kiss cam. I think that's <laughs> Brooklyn did not do that. Um, to be honest, that, that, that's you. so awkward. Just yeah, yeah, you're trying to put on the kiss cam much. on the first date. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but to be fair, like she posted a picture at the end of the day of, of him kissing her cheek at the end of the day, like a true gentleman. And she said to TMZ the other day after her Sports Illustrated swimwear shoot, <laughs> <clears throat> um, yeah, that yeah, she's gonna take him for a second date. So shoot your shot, young fella. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, you nah. Are... I got I gotta wait for the second date to happen. Jeannie has a history of backing out of stuff. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> Tell me more, Mister King. Re- re- Provide oh, yeah. the remember context. Remember that guy that she? Remember that guy she rejected? Like, oh, some random guys. Like, oh, Jeannie, we go to prom with me, and oh my god. <laughs> oh yeah, because because he um, spelled her name wrong. Oh wow! Oh, no. Is the, is oh, she yeah, that yeah, petty? She... Yes. yes. Oh my yes. god! Yes. yes. <laughs> Come on! It's just Pe- a little pettier than pettier than Lee, Richard, Kyle, and Adam. I'm dying. I'm dying. 
Let's go home, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go no, home. I'm done. I'm, I'm quitting the car right now. <laughs> And, uh, and that and that's your NASCAR content for this week's episode. Uh, and that's the that's the show. Good night, everybody. <laughs> oh my god, I'm I'm literally crying. <laughs> wow. Man, it's, wow. Man, 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 man. Oh. I tell you what. I, take it from take it from somebody who has uh, both been on the side of having. Uh, thirsty followers wanting to date me and being that thirsty follower who wants to go out with people on my TL, man, I appreciate that dude bravery. And you know what? If, mm. if this works out for them, good for them. Good, good yeah, for them. It's just weird because apparently she's got a boyfriend. Oh. Whoa, what now? No, maybe, maybe, <laughs> See? I don't know, maybe it's a local relationship. Yeah, like, I, I, I saw people on Twitter saying she's got a boyfriend right now. She's she's actually... Oh, Amory. Oh, jeez. Like, this is where it gets complicated, folks. She's going to be on Maury Povich by this time next week. Uh, <laughs> but, um, like, th- there is a lesson to be learned here, kids. Shoot your shot. It is well worth it. <laughs> yeah, you, you... Don't, go on, don't go on Dr. Phil. You'll be the most annoying meme within a week. Catch, Catch me, me outside, outside bro. <laughs> yeah. No, don't repeat that, please. <laughs> <laughs> so like i said sh- shoot your shot so yeah. um ali raceman if you're listening um if you're ever in london call me okay like we'll go out for pizza we'll, we'll, we'll buy dominoes it'll be a really nice time i'm so i'm totally not putting this in the description of the episode like 44 minute mark yeah we'll, we'll, we'll go with that oh. i'm shooting my shot guys <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, and also Maisie williams if you're ever in brazil i'm single and if you don't have a boyfriend i'm always available Yep. <laughs> King, any any declarations you want to get out there? <laughs> Michaela Schifrin, next time in New York. Yeah, maybe we should hang out sometime. I'm not gonna ask Ali Raisman because I'm from New York, so she's just gonna say no. <laughs> <laughs> Honorary Bostonian and New England page. If I see, I'm already halfway there, King. You see, <laughs> You're halfway there. <laughs> I am willing to sell myself to the devil for a date with Ali Raisman. Make, make that make that official because um, I, I thought you already oh, yeah. did, Patriots fan. <laughs> To be fair, I, I I already kind of did by cheering for them when they actually won the damn thing two weeks ago. But hey, here we are. Nah, <laughs> nah, nah. You, you always, always says the New York Jets fan. Says you, <laughs> who, who's whose owner now represents whoa, my country. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Sup, Woody Johnson, ambassador to the UK. <laughs> Answer yourself, King. <laughs> Okay. Actually, I never actually listed the three countries where homosexuality was legal. Bahrain's not one of them, just so you know. I'm shocked huh. at this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi's on the list. Uh, Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, well, Russia. Malaysia's already I'm gone, surprised. so that's not... Oh, yeah, Malaysia's that gone. So, so that's two. So Singapore, get, get your shit together. <laughs> Yeah, like drop your Grand Prix and your shitty laws against against the homosexuals, please. Thank you. Um, is that about it for keeping it one on one? Has anybody got anything else to add? No, no, no we're doing good. Mm, I think we're I think we're good. I I'm think probably, we're good. Yeah. probably give an honorable mention story to to Claire sure. Williams, who admitting that she made a deal with Botas after she didn't allow him to go to Ferrari. That the next team to come knocking that he wanted to go to, she'd let him go. Somewhere Cook is like fist bumping as we speak. He's still like on a high right now that he's even in that car. Props to Claire Williams, man. That is um. That takes some stones to 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 come out of a deal like that. Stones that even I lack on on of, of that magnitude. Um, so props to Claire Williams on that one. She's a she's a, she's a better one. She's a better one than me. Uh, I'll say that for sure. So honorable mention to Claire Williams, who is awesome most of the time anyway. When she's accusing Williams of not being a pay driver hood, yet hired Bruno Senna. I'm still salty about that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, Alice, just... Alice, if you're listening, um, if there's a if I can get to a British super bike race um you me druid's corner uh lovely afternoon watching the bikes there's me shooting my shot y'all shoot your shot <laughs> shoot your shot like i want i want you guys to tag all of those people when this episode goes out do you understand 
I want yes. Maisie Williams to share the shits out of this podcast. Do you understand? <laughs> I'll do my best. With the, has- <laughs> with the hashtag, shoot your shot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. And just put over like the uh, Snapchat clip I recorded of me trying to hit like a like a shot into a garbage can with like this empty coffee <laughs> cup, and the coffee cup just explodes on the rim. Oh my god! <laughs> oh. Did, I saw did, that did one. you shout out? Did, did you shout out Kobe afterwards? <laughs> uh, I, I wish I did. <laughs> that's the only thing that makes a basket toss complete. You have to shout Kobe as, before you take the shot. That's how it works. Uh, so it's, on that note, we, we've done shooting our shots for the day. We're now going to get into some more of that as we talk about Formula E and the Bay Prix. Yes, that's actually a thing. <laughs> This Valentine's Day, spend your weekend with Bay. Bay Pre, the Buenos Aires E Pre. The third round of the Formula E Championship. Uh, King, how long was it between the the Marrakesh Grand Prix E Pre and uh, this E Pre at Buenos Aires? About the same <clears throat> length between London's season finale this year and this year's season opener in Hong Kong. Oh, for the love of God. <laughs> <laughs> Like it was a it was a good three months, wasn't it? Yes, it, it was a good. Oh, like even if you if you watched like the little highlight package and all the interviews that they have leading up to this Grand Prix before the actual race start, it made it feel like it was uh like a season opener. Like yeah, that's they had to do flashbacks of the previous race. Remember what happened last time. Yeah, not much. Sebastian Bremi won. Felix Broken Fist was unlucky not to win, and we had that shitty E Pre. Um, <laughs> the last time we saw, the well, last time we saw Formula E, truly E Pre was still around. <laughs> <laughs> that may be just a slight exaggeration. Just, just a little bit. Like, wasn't Catherine Legg still in the series? That was fun. Um, yeah. And nobody, and still to this day, nobody knows who Makeda Chiruti is. Um, mm. But in the, in the meantime, I think I think we mean a future electric GT superstar, Michaela Chiruti, By the way, uh, I like the awkward just, silence uh, at the end. Of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, we'll see about that. Keep, keep trying for that dream, girl. Keep trying for that dream. <laughs> shoot your shot, girl. Shoot your shot. <laughs> um, <laughs> But let, let's talk about the Bay Prix at Buenos Aires, Argentina. One, I think one of the better rounds on the Formula E calendar, for sure, in terms of location, in terms of track layout. It's always, like, it seems to have produced like two, there's like two for two for quality races so far since they've been on the calendar. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm, yes, I'm, not, I'm not saying this because Matt is here, but South America really is the best place for Formula E. You're yeah, welcome. That's right. Yep, yep. E- even though the best race on the calendar is in Uruguay, but hey, hey, who's counting? <laughs> Bring back Punta del Este, damn it! Please. Me too. Uh, Lucas Degrassi finally took his first Formula E pole position, which That's weird. is a surprise given that he's been a title contender for the last two years, that this is now just his first pole position. It's like Daniel Ricciardo all over again. Ricciardo had won three rounds before he had a pole position when it was at Monaco in Formula 1 this past season. It's the same sort of deal. Better race guy. And yeah, Lucas, who has been a perennial contender now since Formula E's inception, like, never was able to put it together over a pole lap until today when we had another hashtag Bremi bottle, as the social medias likes to hail it these days. Because Bremi can't string together a qualifying lap to save his life, um, it's it's kind of weird like that. But yeah, it did feel really surprising to have Lucas get that first pole position. But um, as we quickly found out as the race went on, it didn't really mean much in the grand scheme right. of things. So last year, um, Sebastian Bremi started last and ended up finishing second and gaining on the eventual race winner Sam Bird. Um, take a guess what Sebastian Wemmy did from third on the grid this year with arguably an even stronger car uh, than he had this time one season ago. Uh, I, I, he, I, put, he put the beat down. That's not beat a surprise. Beat him down! 
at, at, at this point, it's like, yeah, I think we just know Edams is the best team by a country mile at this point, and it, it's you know what it reminded me a lot of. It reminded me a lot of Valentino Rossi in his prime in the mid two thousands, where he would taunt people. I'm not being salty as a Sete Gibernau supporter back in the day, but <laughs> hear me out. Hear, hear me out on this one. It, it like because Rossi liked to play possum with people. He would like to follow them. See where they were weak, see where they were strong, scout his opponent out there with two laps to go, he'd pass and put the hammer down and win. The, the, the amount of times that would break my soul as a Gibbonal supporter, it, it, it hurt me. Especially when he said in 2004, Sete would never win another race. Oh, right. right. Yeah. Oh, man. man. Um, you look at this uh, final mm. margin of victory between Sebastian Webby and John Eric Vern. Hey, Dr. Helmut Marco, how are you doing? Um, hey, you look right. at the margin of victory and it's like just under three seconds. That's a bit misleading because once Buemi got past Vern in the first handful of laps, uh, he had total control over this race. Second the lap faster in some cases. Just, And it's not a big track. It's a 70-second lap, and he's a second the lap faster than, than the T Cheetah team with John Eric Vern there behind him. He, finished, he would go on to finish in second. Um, just... just <laughs> This is this is gonna this is gonna be a problem, isn't it? Because yeah. It's like Edams have gotten better and better, and the rest of the field just they seem to be drifting further out as time goes on. Like I know they built the car, which is kind of a problem to begin with, because they probably already had an unfair advantage right from the off. But it seems to have gotten worse here, King. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more of a fact a fact of Renault being the most powerful manufacturer there in the series like it seems mm. Renault's involvement with dams this e dams partnership is a lot closer to a true factory team than any other any other of the quote unquote factory teams there whether it be mm. BMW and Andretti or uh, uh DS and Virgin like there it seems like with the other quote unquote factory Audi Sport and App yeah Audi Sport and App for this year maybe yeah cuz they're, they're the other... starting to switch right to to electric cars fully and maybe they're Gonna get get it back maybe next season, hopefully. Yeah. Mm. B- besides Edams, all the other teams, their factory partnerships seem to just be sponsorships. Well, Renault, it really feels like they're a factory team. Yeah, it's kind of in their best interest. I mean, they they're the guys that built the original concept, and they're going to invest in that because they're the guys that built the damn thing. So naturally, you'd think they would invest more into their factory team, quote unquote, to make it work because. It's brilliant advertising. Edam was just curb stomping everybody right now, and nobody else seems to have an answer for him. I mean, yeah, we had the excitement earlier this year of all these potential factories that could join from BMW and, you know, possibly Mercedes in season five, and, you know, Audi officially, you know, supporting the the app team, which hasn't really gone anywhere. I think they still look about the same to me compared to what they were last year, really. And um, Buemi has won all three of the first rounds of the yes. championship this season out of cancer. <laughs> yep, he's he's the first Formula E driver that has ever won three races in a row. Mm-hmm. And it's, while he does have the advantage of easily the most dominant car and drivetrain, um, he is still markedly ahead of his, uh, of his teammate Nicholas Prost um, and has been for much of the last three years. So it's not all just the car. It's no. that Sebastian Buemi might be one of, if not the best driver that is not actively in Formula One that really should be. Yeah, uh, is he the new Kevin Magnussen king? Like, remember Magnussen was our running joke last year that he uh, was the best driver not in F one, and now it's the now Bremi's taking that post. Yeah, <laughs> even though even the last year, that. yeah, I'm pretty sure like it was it wasn't last year, it was two years ago. Two years oh, ago God. was Magnussen. Last year, no, was yeah, Vo- true. Last year it was Van Dorn. I guess this year it's Bremi. <laughs> Yeah, let's just wait for uh, like, uh, for Buemi to get the the Red Bull seat next year. Then, <laughs> <laughs> like, we're we're sorry for getting rid of you, Sebastian. Can you come back, please? Please shoot the shot. Please? Shoot the shot. <laughs> yep. Shoot at the end. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Slide uh, in. Shoot, shoot, shoot the shot, Sebastian. Shoot the shot. You got this, bro. Think, look at your amazing Formula E record. Oh, and the fact that he's a World Endurance Drivers Champion, and he arguably should have been the first double champion of WEC and Formula E in the same damn year. 
Yeah. Still salty at new Nelson PK for taking it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To be fair, there's there's plenty of reasons to be salty at Nelson PK. But uh, Laura, if you're listening, don't don't don't, don't mute your microphone at this point. <clears throat> but um, Jose Jose Maria Lopez had an interesting race. He mm. started at the back. He quickly worked his way up through the field at his home track and managed to finish tenth despite. I believe heading the wall on his final yep. lap of the race. Yep. <laughs> so he hit the ball he, twice like, shot the same day. Shot. Then. <laughs> yep. That's shot curious. a shot. Yeah, got a he... point. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna really let the back end come out on this last lap. Do something for the hometown fans. And ow. <laughs> 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 that wasn't the plan. Wait, where's the finish line? Oh, there it is. Whew. So, um, Citroen have not had a good start to their motor racing year so far because. Um, DS Virgin only had Lopez in the points. Sam Bird DNF'd. Uh, their World Rally Championship campaign has not gotten off to the best of starts, where supposed number one driver Chris Breen has Chris Meek, cri- uh, Chris Meek has Chris Breen Chris Meek has <laughs> bottled it in two straight rallies. Yeah, then, uh, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not saying anything, but I think because of most of the press and rallying is are British, Chris Meek might be a little bit overrated. Oh, 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 really? Whatever gave you that idea? It was it something to do with his auto sport ranking we talked about over Christmas? Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, like, like to most. But you guys, he's the he's the most promising thirty eight year old young gun in <laughs> WRC right now. <laughs> also, you gotta remember, he's losing, so he's Irish, as is Craig Breen. <laughs> yes, of course. He's, he's he's not one of us. He, he hasn't won yet. Like like that fellow Englishman, Andy Murray. Um... <laughs> <laughs> But um, other things I want to mention, mention from this Grand Prix, I mean, King, I don't know if you were on social media as the race was going on, but I saw a lot of fans take a dump on this race from a great height. And it's it seems like the initial gloss of this series has worn off now. Like, really, really worn off. I know, Matt, you weren't particularly kind about this Grand Prix on Twitter. I, I saw you tweet about it. I mean... It's it's is it it, it it can't help that Buemi right now is just kicking everybody's asses in right now, and Edams looks practically unbeatable with that combination right now. And now, this race wasn't particularly entertaining either. Yeah, <laughs> there was stuff happening in towards the middle of the grid, but like that's all for middle of the grid stuff. It's it's, it's yeah, not like, like Formula One. If you're gonna watch Formula One for the racing, you have to watch the middle of the grid. You don't want that to happen to Formula E as well, or else the the, the charm of the the series is gonna go away. Yeah, because if it's not for the lead or for a podium position, most people aren't gonna matter, and rightfully so. And I think that's what it got a lot of manufacturers interested in coming into Formula E. That the first, like the first season, like you had no idea who was gonna be in the podium any given race. Indeed, yeah, we had guys from like Sarazan to Nicholas Prost to you know Jerome D'Ambrosio winning a couple I of rounds. Ha- I still have the hats from uh, from last year's Putra Dry Grand Prix where um, Robin Frins w- crabbed his way to a podium in his second Formula <laughs> E race. <laughs> That was amazing. And that I was... and I want a signed hat from Antonio Felix da Costa and Nathaniel Berthon and none and neither and Timaguri doesn't even exist anymore and yeah. Berthon's out even in series. Yeah, I should put my Amelie Naguri cap that's been signed by da Costa and Salvador Duran and put it on eBay. I might get like three or four quid for it. Yeah, like... just remember <laughs> to put in the title: three-time Macau Grand Prix winner Anthony yes, Felix da Costa. Put yeah, it in man, big bold letters. Shot, <laughs> <laughs> big bold letters. <laughs> big, Big capital. There's like put a misleading thumbnail in there. You know, <laughs> roll uh, with Felix it. Rosen. Felix Rosenquist uh, finished 18th, three laps down. He uh. did get the fastest lap of the race. So hey, uh, it's it. Yeah, it's nice to see a uh, Swedish dude named Felix having a good week for once. Yeah, he, he didn't get fired. <laughs> he didn't get fired. So good job. Yeah, we, yeah, Disney didn't drop him. He wasn't accused of being an anti-Semi. It's it's been a good week for other Felixes from Sweden. Well, that that we can definitely confirm. <laughs> oh, yeah. and shout out to the Mitch Evans fan club, all four of you. I hope you enjoyed his dive bomb on Jerome D'Ambrosio because hey, what else are we going to talk about with Mitch Evans? Apart from his you know his, his brilliant ability and his lack of pay. <laughs> you know, yeah, we we, we get... <laughs> but we do know Elizabeth Worth did not enjoy that. I, I can't possibly imagine why. <laughs> is it oh. is it to do with the fact that one like she kills Jerome D'Ambrosio as her quote unquote son, and the fact she can't stand Mitch Evans for shit? Yes. 
it, it helps. Oh my and, goodness. And not to mention... Uh, oh that, my god, and apparently uh, Dragon Racing had a little bit of a tiff that got sorted out the next day when they were eating steak together. Yes, because steak is the great food that brings people together. Like, nothing brings together people like a good steak. Um, yeah. Yeah, this and, race uh, was fine. This race was, was fine. It, it was wasn't okay. great. Mm-hmm. It wasn't anything special, and I, I, honestly, like it, you can see the fans are starting to turn on Formula E, though. Like, th- the series needs another barnstormer at some point, otherwise people are going to drop off the wagon soon. It's, yeah. I think people were watching this bad because they hadn't seen any real motorsport race for a long time, because the, 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 a lot of people in my time didn't really watch the Rolex 24 or the Bar First 12, so this was their first motorsport in a long time, so there was a lot of hype for this race. Yeah, and like, it didn't really if, deliver. Like because there was literally nothing else on, and nothing else has been on. The entire motorsport world was focused on this E pre, and it didn't live up to the hype of all the other probably widely publicized E pre races. Where right. like we were gonna, we were supposed to get rain, and that didn't come. <laughs> That's it. No, I want my all weather race. Damn it. <laughs> No, didn't happen either, which is unfortunate. But uh, hey, who knows? Maybe the next one will come around, isn't it? Like, King, it's only six weeks to the next one. Get hype! (sighs) Get hype. Only 12 more years. (laughs) 12 Uh, more years until season four. Just going to have to hibernate a little (laughs) bit. Hey, it's only a year and a half until season five when we get those cool concept cars. Oh, yeah, we we need to, like, let's have a sub-segment for one of our favorite listeners. Who said Romo? Because there were two. Oh. There were two Romo, dev bots. Romo Why? Race had their first run. Why? Why are you people doing this? <laughs> there was a there was a dog on track. I think that was the fastest car on the track during the Robo Race. Um, both oh the cars were painted up like Argentina soccer clubs. Uh, I think both of them wrecked. Uh, yeah, uh, very fitting. Very wrecked. fitting. Of course. Just like Argentina in most of their football tournaments, they enter these days. Yes. Okay. Here, here's here's a quote from the race report. There was a wo- there was a one lap quote unquote race that was cut short when one of the dev bots misjudged a turn and crashed. But the second- <laughs> <laughs> but the How second- authentic is that? <laughs> but the second car completed the circuit, having achieved an estimated top speed of 116 uh, 116 miles per hour. The mandated the mandated safety limit for the cars in development. There's a safety limit, and one of the cars wrecked. Yes. That is fantastic. Well, that, is, that is amazing. Like, oh, that, that that is awesome. Who said, Romo, you got your fill. Congratulations. But, um, hey, we only got to wait, like, 12 years until season four. You know what it reminds me of? And this is a wrestling reference for you guys. Oh. It reminds me a lot of NXT season four that would just go on forever, and there was never a winner established. <laughs> <laughs> it just, if anyone remembers the early days of NXT where we had Wade Barrett and and, and David Otunga come out of the yes, company, yes. And he had well, when two. when NXT was a game show. <laughs> When yes, NXT and- was like a reality, it was a reality show, but it was all under the guise of wrestling kayfabe and predetermined outcomes. <laughs> Weird. And Michael Cole went ape shit. Oof. Like Michael Cole literally just lost his damn mind in season three over the DVD. So season. it was like tough enough, but you know, without any of like the actual drama involved. Great. It's like watching, it's, that, that's, that's like watching Formula E now for me these days. It's just <laughs> an infinite source of frustration. Just like F1, really. But uh, yeah. that'll just about do it for Formula E from the Bay Pre. You know, hug your loved ones and tell Jerome D'Ambrosi it'll be okay. I'm sure somebody will get disqualified and will inherit another win at some point. Uh, but Lizzie, um, but, uh, we'll move on from that real quick. After this quick musical interlude, we'll announce the first Mount Rushmore of motorsport. This is the part of the show where I take a seat, pull myself a nice, cool, non-alcoholic beverage, 
and let Ryan King take over because this was his idea, <laughs> and I give him full credit for it. So, well, it wasn't we really in- entirely my idea. It was like mostly RJ's idea. Yeah, like, like so, but but in other words, I'm declaring new speaker of the house, Mister King. So, um, so Lord Speaker, uh, you, you may take the reins and uh, welcome to Mount Rushmore, everybody. Uh, sit back and enjoy the show. Okay. Oh, wait, I'm just going to look at the common house of comments. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> well, go, go, well go on, <laughs> the story starts. Last week, RJ kind of, out of the blue a little bit, came up with this question. Who would be F1's, like, the first inaugural class into F1's Hall of Fame? Like, first inaugural five, but one of them ha- has to not be a driver. And that was a really... Very interesting question. I couldn't come up with an immediate mm. answer, to be honest. And that's King, the avid F1 historian, talking. <laughs> Carry on. Sorry, I, I, I had to get that in. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I put together uh, a plan to get to see who we could get. Number one, we had to expand it from five because five is just like far too few. That is like mm-hmm. yeah. So we expanded that up to six. In tr- in the grand old tradition of that's how points used to be given out to the top six. Yep. Clever. Sounds good to me. Mm. Yes, and I decided to give our Mount Rushmore a name so we don't have to call it Mount Rushmore and get people confused. Especially yep. to non-Americans who might not know what Mount Rushmore is. And, and especially given that we're probably going to do this again at some point. <laughs> yes. So, so what, I, what, what have you called it then? Calling it Mount Nivelt out of respect to the first president of the FIA and the first president of the uh, Automobile Club de France, and, and he also co-founded that club, Etienne Van Zulen Van Nivelt, and also his wife, who was also the first woman to participate in a motor racing event. That is the nerdiest thing you have ever said. I love it. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that's impressive even for you, King. <laughs> <laughs> so so basically, listeners, listeners, I put together a short list, 20 people on the short list, and we're going to run through all 20 of them, four at a time. We're going to give our pros and cons. I think the general rules about who could be on the short list and not on the short list was, one, they had to be retired. So sorry, Vettel or, Sabat, or, or, or Adrian Newey or... <clears throat> Lewis Hamilton, or God forbid, like there would be like some public outcry to get Max Verstappen in at in, like his third season. Would it, would it surprise anybody <laughs> if that actually happened? <laughs> oh, he, he would probably uh, break it into, into the first class without even being retired. <laughs> he probably just midway yeah. through his career. He's a legend. <laughs> he's he's a legend. It's like so. Current guy's not in, and you can be recognized for. Uh, things you did outside of Formula One, but you had to have some sort of relevant Formula One career. So, yes, like Mario Andretti is going to be mentioned as one of the nominees for his huge career, which might have only involved one world championship, but he had a massive career, which is probably going to be unparalleled. Mm hmm. So, so to, any questions, yeah, guys? Any questions before we get this started? Do you think we're going to make ourselves look as stupid as most of the people that vote on the Pro Baseball Hall of Fame every year? No, that that is a very low bar to get over. We will successfully be... I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm sure we that, can that do is it. Like having, that, that is like having a high jump contest and the bar is on the floor. If we don't get over that, we need to stop this podcast immediately. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> Okay. so let's get started. First four nominees on this list. We Number one, we have John Surtees, the four-time motorcycle world champion and one-time Grand Prix world champion on four wheels. Only got to win it on two and four. You could arguably say he was a lot better in MotoGP than he was in Formula One. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Number two, the guy that I mentioned earlier, Maru Andretti. He is a Formula One world champion. He is also the only person, well, other than Dan Gurney, who is unfortunately not on this list, to have races won in Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, and the World Sports Car Championship. 
Third, we have Jim Clark, uh, two-time Formula One world champion, one-time Indianapolis 500 winner, and unfortunately his career was tragically cut short when he died on the Hockenheim ring in a Formula Two race. And last person on this list, we have another guy to win a championship on two and four wheels. We have Tanzio Nuvolari, European motorcycle champion, and also uh, European automobile world champion, and quote, from Ferdinand Porsche himself, the greatest driver there ever was, is, or will be. So, Bret Hart. So that... <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Bret Hart stole that quote from Ferdinand Porsche about Tanz- <laughs> Tanzio Nuvolari. That, I'm, sure that's, I'm sure that's totally what happened. No, no, that's, <laughs> that's legitimately what happened. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who knew? That, I was joking. Um, um, okay, jeez. Uh, okay. So, who wants to start? <laughs> uh, I would just like to also point out that I didn't know Tyson Nuvolari did motorcycles as well. I, I had only heard of him from this documentary that I watched as a kid, which uh, chronicled the very beginnings of motorsport all the way to Formula One in the mid-90s. And they briefly talked yeah. about the guys like Caracciola and Nuvolari, but they never said anything about the other kinds of motorsports, so I was very surprised to hear that. Yeah, like, one of the things I tried to do when grouping the four that we talk about, this kind of, try to have each one have a theme, and this one is to people who were successful in more, in Formula One and elsewhere. Obviously, Surtees has a career in motorcycle racing, but he actually retired from motorcycle racing to compete in F1. Nuvolari did both at the same time. That's even more Jesus. impressive. Yeah, it's just crazy. Um... My two cents on this is that I think when people talk about who the greatest British driver of all time is, is that John Surtees gets mentioned a lot in this. And I've always had Surtees down as the great X Factor because how much of a measure do you put on his biking career and not the fact he wasn't in F1 originally? He, again, he was, as you say, he retired from, from Grand Prix motorcycle racing to get into motorsport on four wheels rather than two. I don't think any of those four scream out to me as an absolute first ballot, first ballot top of the pile kind of candidate for me. But Nuva, I didn't know Nuvolari did both at the same time, so that's huge for me. Um, yeah, probably what Nuvolari is most famously known for was uh, the 1935 German Grand Prix when this was the second season that Mercedes and Audi had entered Grand Prix racing. And essentially, if you weren't in a German car, you weren't going to win. Unfortunately, at, you know, the German Grand Prix, Nuvolari, in a non-German car, won the Grand Prix on the Nürburgring through pure skill, a little bit of luck, and a whole hell of a lot of determination, and that was the only non-German win from 1935 to the start of World War II. Jesus. <laughs> Yikes. That's, that, that says a lot right there. Um, Jesus. Um, Mario Andretti is an interesting one, because Mario's only got just the one, but again, his career is, is so tr- almost transcendent in terms of what he's driven, his longevity, and just the disciplines he's taken part in over the years. Um, that's another interesting one as well, because Mario's is such a, a is such an important figure in North American racing. Period. Um, anyone got any, anyone ever got any, any two cents on on those four? Because this yeah. is interesting. Man, I I kind of feel like I, I to me. Jim Clark really doesn't get enough credit. No, he doesn't. I mean, yeah, he's... For his era, he was easily the most dominant driver of his day. Yeah. Uh, In 1963 and 65, his two championship seasons, um, he won or finished on the podium of every race that he did not retire from with a mechanical failure in an area where there was a whole lot of mechanical attrition. Yeah, Um, and I think those two seasons, he also scored as many points as he possibly could. There was no way he could have scored more points in that season because that was still in the era of drop results. So essentially all the points scored that year were wins. Right, he skipped skipped the 1965 Monaco Grand Prix, a race he easily could have won, to win the 1965 Indianapolis 500. Yeah, so he won the 500 in the same year he scored the maximum amount of points achievable in a F1 season. That's pretty crazy. You don't see that stuff nowadays. He could have easily won it. 
<laughs> could have easily won another title in 67 had it not been for some mechanical issues with the new Lotus 49. Yeah. Um, and of course, in 1968, he won the very last Formula One race he ever entered. When he won that 1968 South America African Grand Prix, he took the all-time career wins lead from Juan Manuel Fangio, and which was later broken by Jackie Stewart just a few years later. Yeah, and I mean, to say he only won the Indianapolis 500 once is like a massive understatement because on two other occasions he he finished second. Yikes. Yeah, I think Jim Clark is like the British driver that nobody talks about potentially being the finest to ever come out of this country. I know Lewis Hamilton has the achievements and you know everybody loves Jackie Stewart for for various reasons, the safety, the success, the tartan, um and whatnot. I know Mansell gets a lot of love from the guys that are probably a little bit older than me who watched and raced in the early 90s, and he was the third wheel, essentially, to uh, Senna and Prost and whatnot. Um, but Clark doesn't get the credit he deserves. Clark was a monster talent, an incredible driver, and again, very sadly, um, his, he died, what was it, just 32, I think it was, King, wasn't it? Yeah, um, he died like Yeah, he died at the age of 32. Yeah, and he'd already had two world titles underneath his belt, and it probably would have gone on for a, l- a lot longer, because those are the days where you raced into your 40s and 50s, not so much now. Um, the world seems to have changed in that regard, but back then, you saw drivers racing their 40s and 50s as well, so who knows how long Clark could have gone on for, and how what, what he could have potentially achieved in the right hands, so... Clark, I think, for me, is right up there. Mario is right up there. Are they in my final six? I'm not sure. Um, But they're they're close. I think they're knocking on the door. I'd have to give give it a bit more thought. Uh, Should we move on to to the next four? I'd probably say... Like, let me... I'm going to give my two cents. I'd probably... Mm. Out of this group, it's... It would have to be one of the... Like, they're... In my mind, they're competing against each other for, like my last spot on if they were right. to get on and uh, it'd probably be between Andretti, Clark, and Nuvolari like Surtees was a great driver but he achieved far more in, in MotoGP where he's I think in MotoGP he's a seven time world champion and he also won the Isle of Man TT like yeah he won it six times he won the Isle wow. of Man TT six times like Jesus. Surtees was far greater as a motorcycle like a motorcycle rider unfortunately Mm -hmm. it seems that way that seems that's what that's for me what seems to stop certes from getting in for me is the fact that he's i think his legacy is greater as a bike racer as he was as a as a motorsport driver so to speak i mean it's it's a little bit it's a little bit like you don't hear people talk about certes motorcycle career it's always about him right. being an F1 world champion. Also, John Surtees was one of the people that helped develop my home track, uh, Barber Motorsports Park in Leeds, yes. Alabama, home of the Honda Indy Grand Prix of Alabama. And he has his own um, wing of the Barber Motorsports Hall of Fame, yes. which features some of his world championship bikes and his championship winning Ferrari from 64. The more you know. Yeah, that, that's well, kind of weird. Like, Essentially, the Surtees Hall of Fame is in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. So, any more sense you want to add there, King? Uh, no, that's all. I think we'll move on to the next four, which I've kind of kept to manager designers, kind of the closest manager designers that I could get to, the best four I could assemble. And Sure. Okay, first we're going to talk about the Mercedes Grand Prix team, the original one. Uh, on this list, I have Alfred Neubauer. He was uh, essentially Mercedes team principal from 1926 to 1955. And under his leadership, Mercedes won uh, three European championships and two World's Drivers Championships in early Formula One. They also won uh, the 1952 Carrera, Pan- <laughs> Carrera Panamericana and the 1952-24 Hours of Le Mans. And... Essentially, Neubauer was Neubauer was Mercedes Benz during that period. He was like twenty six is when they started their Grand Prix team up again after the after World War One, and fifty five was obviously when they had to leave the sport because of the Le Mans disaster. And Neubauer retired and just left the sport completely when Mercedes left. 
N- next on the list is uh, Rudolf uh, Olenhart. He was their designer. He he was he was the guy who designed the iconic Mercedes Silver Arrows, and of the twenty five like major Grand Prix races that Olenhart's cars entered, uh, his cars won sixteen of those races. Yikes! And yeah, like if pretty much if. Like modern day F one, that'd be like if Adrian Newey like designed like an RB, like one of Vettel's Red Bulls like every year for a decade. Yikes, <laughs> that is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> and now the other two are gonna be more modern, <laughs> like more modern designers than those guys. Well, first up is Colin Chapman. He. I yes. mean, I would say he's synonymous with Lotus to the fact that he, he basically is Lotus, where he yeah. he led Lotus to seven World's Constructors Championships, six Drivers Championships, uh, Jim Clark's Indy 500 win, that was him. Innovations in the sport, probably, like, this, he, he made, he par- partially made Formula One what it is today from a team principal standpoint where he introduced he was the first team principal to get corporate sponsorship from his team from a to to the point where that he needed to change the liver on on his car that he was the first person to take advantage of the FIA loosening up the rules on liveries to say yeah you could buy our livery <laughs> so, hey hey that works sponsors yeah, yeah sponsors <laughs> and essentially he used sponsor money to further the innovations which he was also good at he like even before the the 68 season where he brought in sponsorship in 62 he was the first team principal to have um monocoque chassis on his automobiles like the the entire the entire car was going to be one piece and he also in 68 downforce he had aerodynamic wings on his car which before then you would only see that in can-am in the states like to europe Downforce was foreign, and Chapman brought it over. Yikes. And he also took Downforce to the ultimate level with the ground effect cars of the late 70s, where essentially essentially it was... uh, You would have these tunnels in the chassis, in the floor of the car, and it would suck the car to the ground. I think Mario Andretti Mm -hmm. said it was like the car was painted to the track. Yeah, people keep That's... talking about that stuff nowadays. It, I don't think they really uh, know about the, the big impact that that thing had. It was really like the car was driving on rails. It's a crazy yeah. amount of grip. Yeah, mm-hmm. crazy, crazy amount of grip based on what they like the power the car had. Like essentially, yeah, it just had to slow down so the car could make it around the corner. You didn't really have to worry about like the car going off the road, but essentially that was the main problem with ground effect cars. If you were to happen to be in a situation where the car would go off the road, you're essentially gonna die. See, that's the main problem. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Last, yeah so that's, that's kind of an issue. <laughs> last guy on this list, Keith Duckworth. He was a former Lotus engineer who left with another Lotus engineer to found Cosworth, and he designed the legendary Cosworth DFV, which made all of Chapman's aerodynamic innovations m- more feasible because he didn't have to worry about developing his own engines and spending money on that. He could just buy a stock engine and just race. And the DFV was originally intended to be exclusive to Lotus, but Ford, who was funding the project, knew that was going to be bad for business if, if essentially... Only Lotus had access to the, this engine, and they were gonna have. What? <laughs> <laughs> and, and My they phone were, went off there. My bad. <laughs> and they were gonna have like the most dominant engine in the sport, and essentially Ford didn't want F1 to become unpopular because if F1 was unpopular, what's the point of them funding this F1 project? Where have I right. seen that before? Uh, mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, essentially. The DFV had the DFV helped cars win. I think out of the 226 races, I mean the 262 races it was in, it won 155 of them, and that was between 1976. 
1967 and 1985, and essentially, wow. yeah, it it won 12 drivers championships during that period, and it, that was a period of less than 20 years. It was a period of 18 years. It won 12 championships. Right throughout the 70s, it was pretty much not just a customer engine, but the customer engine, and it was still winning races over a span of three decades. Yeah. Over- that is unheard of today. Yeah, completely Whoa. unheard of today to have a spec engine be the spec engine. Like, the, the only companies that didn't use the DFE were basically Ferrari and then Matra for one season, then they switched over to using the <laughs> DFE. <laughs> and... Even outside of F1, the DFV had an impact because here in the States, there was the DFX, which was a turbocharged version of the DFV, which won 10 Indy 500s in a row. Yikes. And, and, it, all, and, it, all stems, and it all stems down to that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it had 10 Indy 500s in a row. I think it also had, it had 81 IndyCar victories in a row over a span of five years. Five years, it was undefeated. And in total, the DFX had 153 wins over here compared to the 155 it had in Grand Prix racing. So, Keith Duckworth, oh my god, if it wasn't for Keith Duckworth, we'd probably be in a different world right now. That's ridiculous. Probably a much slower world. So, a much so, slower world. Probably, yeah, absolutely. So, anyone got any thoughts on this one? I mean... Mm. This, this could be really tough if we're limiting ourselves to only one non-driver. It is. I already right. I was already thinking here. I was I was um King told me about the told me about Duckworth yesterday night. But now that I yep. hear also all the things about Chapman, I'm really conflicted now because uh, I'm going to be honest, I don't really know much about the Mercedes. So they weren't they were never really my main yeah. pick. Mercedes in the 50s, 50s and 60s F1 I basically know nothing. So um uh, yeah. So really, it's kind of hard to pick between uh, Cosworth, Duckworth, and Lotus Chapman, because they all brought so much to the table. Um, I think, I think I would go for Chapman more because um, his innovations are better seen nowadays. They're they stood the test of time longer. However, Duckworth sure. um, has a, also has his own great share of history be, by being so dominant in like the certain era of racing. Matt, the cap toss. The cap toss. It's Chapman. <laughs> the cap toss. I mean, like, looking back on Chapman, like, modern Formula One, like, as being a constructor sport is down to both these two people. And it, it's, mm. oh, it, it's hard to separate the two in my mind because without the DFV, Chapman would have been stuck. Like, he, he probably would have been you know a great team principal at lotus and also a designer at lotus being able to design cars but right ferrari would have been a much greater presence than they were in the 70s if it wasn't for the dfv oh that's hard that is so so hard um I'd probably lean towards chapman on this one uh, probably is he's probably going to be my non-driver pick. I think Chapman's innovations and just his mantra of lightness and just the way he designed cars were so imperative and it's basically the backbone for racing on any level now to this point. And I the think monocoque, that- the first successful <laughs> car to have the drivetrain as a as a stress bearing part. Yeah, of the yeah, car. like the D- wings, the DF torsion bar suspension, ground effect aerodynamics. Yeah, like the DFV was the first engine to have the have the engine be a stress member because Colin Chapman suggested it. But as you say, if it wasn't for Duckworth, Chapman would have been stuck at some point. So yeah, they kind yeah. of both needed each other to be the people they ended up being. Um, you, almost, you almost get the feeling like you would only leave Chapman out of your top six because you want to have Keith Duckworth in it as well. And it's a tough, <laughs> tough first six to pick. Or do you consider dropping a driver to get them both in? That is also mm. true. Oh, that, yeah. is also that, true. that is a possibility. I didn't know that. Hmm. Mm. Do you drop a, the, do you do you drop a driver to four and put them both in? That's an interesting and, and question. Like, the, the funny part is we 
we have like the way I set it up. We have a drive around next, then another non drive around, which is probably going to have a lot of names that you're probably expecting to be on the non driver list. Oh god. <laughs> okay, roll out the drivers, King. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Next four, we have obviously the other icon of the '60s besides Jim Clark, Graham Hill, who. Formula One world champion, Indianapolis 500 champion. Uh, I would say, do I say his career was better? Than, that's like a really hard to say because Indianapolis 500 champion, Monaco Grand Prix winner, Formula One world champion, 24-hour Le Mans winner. Only driver, He's the only yeah. driver to hold the modern triple crown. Yeah, the only driver to ho- have the triple crown. And uh, it's... His career is very fascinating because it, it isn't as, like, if you look at his statistics, it isn't as dominated, dominating as you think it would be because he only has 14 wins from 176 starts. Yes, yes and he hung around a long time, like, probably longer than he should have as a driver. Probably got hurt at the odd time as well. Yeah, he, he was dealing with a lot of injuries too. <laughs> yep, next on the list is probably a lot of people are going to, immediately want to jump to put him in the top six, and that is Ayrton Senna, the three-time world champion. Uh. Fight me. <laughs> like, okay. do, like three-time world champion, do I need to say more? It's Ayrton 41 Senna. 41 Grand Prix victories, retired, um, well, not retired. Well, not really. <laughs> well, when he's, well, when, his, when he when he died in 1994, he was the second winningest driver, and he held the record for the most pole positions, which took Michael Schumacher almost his entire career of 15 years to break, and Senna did it in 10. Uh, give it a year, Lewis Hamilton. Will and I would there, say, as as influential as his career was, his death was probably just as influential on the sport itself going forward. Absolutely. I think nowadays it's probably the main influencer for all the safety uh, issues and concerns and advances we have. Yeah, not just center, not just center the weekend in general. Given we lost uh-huh. Ratzenberger the day before. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Next on the list we have. Uh, who did I put here? Oh, we have Sir Jack Brabham. Uh, the, ooh, ooh. Yeah, yeah. An- uh, another three-time world champion, and he also the only world champion to win it in a car bearing his own name. That's big. Jack Brabham is like a probable top 10 all-time driver as it is. He's in the top 10 to 15, I'd say, for sure. Triple world champion, and of course, the legacy of the Brabham mark, and a legacy that still lives on to this day, uh, in, in the form of Matthew Brabham memes and Punta del Este, <laughs> but even so, um, and he's also uh, I think if not the only, maybe one of an only handful of drivers have Grand Prix victories in three different decades. I think he's the only one. Yeah, he's probably like the only one to do it in Formula One. But yeah, he's probably the only one. I think I think I'm pretty darn sure he's the only man to have won a Grand Prix in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. No, no, 50s, no, 50s. 60s, and so, yeah. Oh, because he won a bad. championship in 59. Then, yeah, because my bad. Yeah, his his first season was 55. His last season was 70, which he was able to get a win in. I was I was one digit out. I'm terrible with years. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> Go on. And we of course last last of this grouping. Uh, Jackie Stewart, who, again, his Grand Prix career was astounding. He was probably, at the time of his retirement, most people would say he was the best driver of all time. <laughs> Three-time world champion, twice runner-up. Uh, I don't know why he became a commentator in IndyCar after his career ended, because he never won a 500. Get your money. <laughs> Get your money. Yeah, probably and he was. And he was one of the first big advocates for safety in the sport. I think at the start of his career, there were no safety barrier. Like the closest thing you would get to a safety barrier around a racetrack at the time of his, at the start of his career, were hay bales. By the end of his career, every single circuit needed to have Armco around it. Mm-hmm. Right, and he was also a big advocate for having actual trained medical professionals on staff. Yes, um, from from an accident that he suffered, where he he didn't know if he was in safe hands when he had this accident. Yeah, I think I I think I know what accident you're talking about. At I think 
one of the early Belgian Grand Prix in his career where he's accident spa and essentially there was like no track marshals around. It was I don't know how long it took for help to get him. And then once he got help, they took him by stretcher to the first care like the first the first aid station they had at the track where he was just they laid him on the ground on a stretcher with nothing to do. Then they had to transport him like half an hour by car to Brussels to a hospital. Then from that they just, you know, were easily able to get him medical attention. Even flew him by jet back to the UK to receive medical attention and it kind of showed this disparity in his mind about the wealth that the sport had, yet the safety was nothing in comparison to what was actually there. Right, so that's the four, isn't it? Yeah, that's the four. Stewart, Hill, Senna, and Brabham. I'm conflicted on this one, and there is one obvious piece of conflict in my mind here, and that is... If I'm putting it and center in, I have to put Adam Prost in. For me, they go mm. in together. And I'm not sure if I want to give up two spots for Senna and Prost. But Senna is arguably the most important Formula 1 driver of all time. Because he changed the legacy of the sport forever. When he was on the track and when, and when he eventually died and the impact it would have on the sport. Senna is... An incredible figure, and he. Many people will say he's the greatest of all time, and he is. I think for many people, the embodiment of what they want a racing driver to be, and it's that physical manifestation of, you know, passionate, you know, dedicated, hardcore racer, ruthless, aggressive. You name it, all the buzzwords you can think of regarding a racing driver, you can sum it up, sum it up all back to Ayrton Senna. He's probably going to end up going in, isn't he? Um, yeah, there's... like the yeah. the uh, like the safety debate on Senna, like the influence of Senna's career. I'd say uh, it probably would have happened eventually. Like Senna was lar- like without a doubt, Senna was a catalyst for what had happened. But it, I've it it probably would have been actually worse if. If it had happened later, damn it! <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, it, it's, like, it's, it's almost like he sacrificed himself for our sins. Essentially, <laughs> it was it was basically what happened with NASCAR, where there was a rash of fatalities um, in the sport in 2000, and the sport really didn't pay much mind to um, head and neck safety until Dale Earnhardt Sr. perished in a crash in the 2001 Daytona 500, and that was the wake up call where they said, "Right, we really need to get things going." Yeah, if we have, but like there. a lot of, uh, like harkening back to the the Jackie Stewart era and what safety improvements were made then, like a lot of things that we take for granted now were actually there because of Jackie, like the 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 safety the safety harnesses actually weren't mandatory, like seatbelts were not mandatory until Jackie Stewart. <laughs> Which is like yeah, insane so. to think about. Seatbelts were not mandatory up until that point in the world. Oh, it's so silly in um, hindsight. I'm, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, make, I'm, I'm making it quite clear. I want Jackie Stewart in. He needs to and be. I yes. will fight. I, I will fight you to get Jackie Stewart in there. If like, like that yeah. is like that is that is my sort. I want Jackie Stewart in there, and I don't okay. care who I've got to roll over to make that happen. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. I have a list of improvements up until Jackie Stewart, like two seasons after Jackie Stewart retired, when they got all the safety implementations in. Uh, let's see. There were required medicals for drivers before races. That was not a thing before. Six-point harness was mandatory. Uh, five seconds maximum for driver evacuation from the cockpit. That was made mandatory. Uh, I said the arm codes before. Uh, onboard fire extinguishers. Two of them, in case one failed, that was made mandatory. And also the safety bladder fuel tanks, the, the non-spill ones that won't, that are very hard for them to cut open. Right. And just in case anybody forgot, Jackie Stewart was the most dominant driver of his era. Like, there was a misconception during his time that he was just driving scared. Oh, on the contrary, he was probably one of the best. He put down some curb stompings. He retired as the most successful driver in his sport. 
he was for a while the only driver from the United Kingdom to have three world championships a record later matched by Lewis Hamilton yeah like he, he was, was yeah. he was through. the he was the only three time world champion until Lewis Hamilton came around I completely overlooked that yeah he for, he was the standard bearer for British drivers for 40 odd years that's ridiculous Jackie Stewart is in I, yeah. I don't care I what any of there, you this tell me there's one quote <laughs> that I love from Jackie Stewart where he said I would have been a much more popular world champion if I always said what the people wanted to hear I might have been dead I might have been dead but I would have been more popular <laughs> God bless him. (laughs) Who wouldn't give his life for just that little bit more popularity, right? (laughs) Me. Oh, dear. (laughs) My my YouTube died around 2015. I know the feeling. Um, (laughs) But, uh, yeah. For me, Jackie Stewart is in. I'm on the fence with with Brabham. Brabham is, like, right on the line for me. Uh, Because... I know I'm probably going to have to put Senna and Prost in, and there's one other driver that hasn't been mentioned yet, but is almost certainly going to be in there as well. Um, he drives red a lot. You know, he's <laughs> quite popular. You know, you, you can probably already guess who that is. Um, <sighs> Brabham for the team ownership and the team development and the legacy of his name is also really quite valuable. Yeah, because and... Brabham would eventually be the team that Bernie Ecclestone buys for a hundred thousand pounds. Mm, he turned that alright, didn't he? Um I'm not sure, because it's like my I, I Brabham would probably just about make it in on my side. Like of the five drivers I can think of that I put in, it would probably be he'd be my fifth put. He'd probably be my fifth pick. Yeah, I don't it's... know how you guys feel on that, but <laughs> um, I, I am waiting until we get through all the groups. Um, should we go to the next one? Yes. Okay, uh, yeah, we can go to the next one. The next one is the last of the non-driver group. First, I'll say this name first. To, to continue along the line of safety, we have uh, F1's first and longtime serving safety and medical delegate, uh, Professor Sid Watkins. The God. The God. Yes. <laughs> if, if there was ever a real-life Formula One Hall of Fame, I don't know if he would get in first class, but I guarantee you he should be in. If not, it, have an award named in his honor, my goodness. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. One of the most important people in the history of the sport, without question. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, next on the list is prob. Next on the list is the person who hired him, Bernie Ecclestone, longtime Formula One executive. Briefly, for like one race, a Formula One driver, longtime Formula One team principal. Need we say more on that one? <laughs> right. It was. It was under his under his leadership and Formula One management that we have. Uh, race broadcasting um, the way it is today, as we talked about when Bernie Ecclestone was uh, forced out of power in the sport just a couple weeks ago. Yes, Man, just a couple. God, that seems so long ago. Yeah, that's that's the only reason why he's eligible for this list. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like if it wasn't if it wasn't for him being forced out, he would he would definitely be first ballot Hall of Famer, probably to some people controversially for I don't know what reasons. <laughs> Next. Next, we have probably when people say team principal, it's the first person that comes to mind when it comes to Formula One, Enzo Ferrari. Ah. Big name. Big name. I mean, I, I, you really can't go through his achievements because his achievements are Ferrari's achievements. He is Ferrari. Literally. Yeah, he is, he is the face of the most important mark in Formula One history. The backbone of the sport we now love today. The fact they get 90 million bucks a year just for showing up, for God's sake. Yeah, I mean, Ferrari is a team principal. He wasn't really an innovative team principal, but he always did what worked. He always took the best option available and hoped for success. And usually, most of the time, it led to success. And he was personally the head of the team until the mid-70s when he got replaced by Luca de Montezemolo. He did all right, too, to be fair. Yeah. (laughs) Yep, last one. Last on the list. uh, The team principal before Enzo Ferrari, uh, Ettore Bugatti, the team principal. I mean, he's probably 
if you put Ferrari and Chapman in one, that's what that's what Bugatti was. His most legendary car was the Type Thirty Five, and yes. if if I told you if I told you the statistics, you would think I was lying. <laughs> when during the Type Thirty Fives, I think eight year run, it won over a thousand races. Huh? <laughs> yeah, like uh. at its peak, at its peak, the Type Thirty Five was so high selling and so widely available that it averaged about fourteen race wins a week. A week? Yes. <laughs> How? Because it it raced in literally everything. Any any race in Europe had a Type Thirty Five. I think the nineteen uh, the nineteen thirty one Monaco Grand Prix it had twenty five entries and sixteen of them were Type Thirty Five Bugattis. So in other words, you're saying the Bugatti may may have been inventable for the like may have been basically the creator of the most dependable racing car of all time, basically. Yes. <laughs> yes. Where it, God. Where it's it people said that Bugatti was divinely inspired when he designed the Type thirty five, that it was a miracle <laughs> of automobile design. And the fact that it was essentially available to anyone who could afford it. He he was opening to selling it to anyone who just, you know, pulled out the checkbook. A true working class hero in the greedy corporate world of motorsports. Yes, and, uh, just assuming like the Type Thirty Five was also a very expensive machine, so it's not like it was available well, to anyone. <laughs> it's available to those who could afford it, and the Type Thirty Five probably has a legacy of uh, Louis Chiron drove it to win the first Monaco Grand Prix, so it's forever in the record books as the first Monaco Grand Prix winner. So that's a definite known fact. We don't know actually how many races in total the Type 35 won, because obviously there were a bunch of local races at the time, which there are no records for, but we know it's at least a thousand. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Um, so that's our four for the section, right? Yes, our four for the section. Sid Watkins, Bernie Ecclestone, uh, Ettore Bugatti, and Enzo Ferrari. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna have to make some tough decisions here, people. Um, yeah, nothing new. Again, just hold, holding can... out until the uh, holding out until holding the last out. groups. Yep, because to the Super Bowl. Man, oh, yeah. man. God, Sid should be in, but I almost argued the deck is too stacked at this point. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, yeah, remember we we bumped it up to six. Yeah, we and it's still a tight. What... Yes. <laughs> Tight. Like if we we skipped yeah, tight we, some time ago. <laughs> yeah, we uh we originally had this at five, and with five, including one non-driver, we would have had to leave off at least one driver who stopped racing when they had the all-time win. <laughs> oh. God. And damn. this was be- this was before we included team principles. This was before we included pre-war figures. Yeah. Yeah. Like let's. Bugatti did have his own team, which did win a world championship. It's not the world championship, but it won a world championship during the 20s, which did exist in, that the FIA failed to keep alive. Oh, man. So, King, how hard are you going to cape for your man Bugatti here? Let's be honest with each other. Uh, you, we know this is coming. I would s- He's got the Veyron in his car. <laughs> <laughs> yes, company, yes. company car. Company car. Yeah. Company car. <laughs> they, they pay me good money at Bugatti. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. Uh, but nah, no. Nah. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd say Bugatti's gonna have, like if there's gonna be a team principal, probably it's gonna be Chapman then Bugatti because wow, like we know he has at least a thousand wins, but we really don't know. Like the Type Thirty Five was the best car at the time, but we just don't have hard facts on it. But it was the best car at the time. It won every recorded race. Mm-hmm. And what about Bernie? We like, we wouldn't yeah. be the GP fans we are today if it wasn't for Bernie Eccleston. That's a big ass problem. <laughs> yep, he brought because I I yeah. don't want to put him. I don't want to because he's kind of a dick. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he, he 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 brought racing everywhere. There was a season where there was a race behind the Iron Curtain. There was a season where America had three races. There was he he made sure that if. If you wanted to watch Formula One, you could watch it. Either either 
on television are in person. It didn't matter if you if, if you lived under the regime of the Soviet Union. You could watch Formula One. Yeah, that like making Formula One an accessible sport, something that we now crave so much as fans, we owe that to Bernie in a massive part. And that's the problem. The question I asked to, to the panel here is, was the has the last few years of his time as chief executive damaged his legacy to a degree? Mm, like, I don't think all that much. Um, it, it might have yeah, damaged it. No. Like, in the present day, his credibility is almost completely off. But if you go, if you go back and look at it, I think uh, most of the things he did for the sport still stand tall. Yeah. Matt, are you wearing a Rolex on your wrist right now? Um <laughs> Um, I'm was, was, it ship, was it shipped to you? I'm waiting for was it, it in the mail. to you by UPS? I'm waiting for it in the mail. <laughs> yeah, Bernie. It's, it's a Rolex with, it's spelled with a CKS at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just like Alex Lynn. <laughs> oh, dear. But, um, do you put Bernie in above Colin Chapman? <laughs> above oh, like Colin Chapman? Um, that, that is a tougher question. I, I don't... I or, wouldn't. Or, or do you sacrifice a driver to get him in? Um, I, I think considering Bernie has been so recent, it's still part of the recent sport. I, I could argue that you could leave him to a later, a later indication, later ballot. Like you could skip him this one year, but on the next one, he would almost be yeah. obligated to be in because of all the things he contributed in the eighties and the nineties, how he raised the profile of the sport. But between Chapman and Eccleston, I would have picked Chapman to put in first. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I agree. Same. Like the things that Bernie did in the eighties, we we probably won't get the full gist of everything that was his responsibility until like he writes an autobiography or someone writes a biography for him. Because like the Concord Agreement in the eighties that completely changed the sport forever. You can no longer be a part time team, you can no longer buy your own car, you had to be a completely professional outfit. Also the drivers had to be professional, because also in the eighties uh, he made the FIA introduce the super license, so not just anyone could race in Formula One anymore. <laughs> so many important little things that we that we know as part of the sport came from him, and that's kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I I agree with Matt. Maybe next time, I think the the stench of Bernie just leaving now, I think it's still a little bit too fresh. But um, next year, I think I got a feeling we're going to come back to this. We might even dedicate like a part of the website to this. That'd be quite funny, actually, mm-hmm. or quite cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think maybe not yet, but I think maybe next year Bernie can get in. I think I think he will get in eventually because he is one of the most important figures F one has ever had. But it just doesn't quite feel right on this one. I think is that fair to say? Yep, last yep, group. Well, last you probably group. all know who this group comprises of. This group is comprised of the four most dominant drivers this sport has ever seen. Number one, Michael Schumacher, the GOAT. <laughs> like, without a doubt, statistically, he's the greatest yeah. driver this sport has ever had. Seven world championships, unrivaled by anyone before or after Formula One. 91 career wins. Yeah. He had 15 winning seasons. There are only a few drivers that you can count that had seasons. Yeah. <laughs> there are only a, a handful of drivers who even have 15 seasons. Averaged four wins a year pretty much his entire career. And that was a 20 year career that had over 300 races. That is ridiculous. <laughs> with a three year hiatus. Yes, with that a three year hiatus. And next on the list. The man who he had to beat to become the man, Juan Manuel Fangio. Oof. Yeah. Where do you even start on that one? Five world championships is a good way to start. I mean, his win- mm-hmm. like his winning percentage is still unrivaled. He won like over forty percent, close to fifty percent. Couldn't get to that win rate, but yeah, he he entered he entered fifty two Grand Prix, won twenty four of them. Forty-eight percent. percent. Yeah, forty-six percent. He won championships with Alfa Romeo, Ferrari, Maserati, and Mercedes. Yeah, that's still a record. Yeah. <laughs> and according to me and King, on our personal list, the greatest racing driver of all time, basically. Yeah, yeah on our personal list, when we when we did this, I forget which episode. It was one of the early episode. Ones. Eight episode eight. Hugh, it was named Hugh had who over Senna. <laughs> <laughs> 
and um, it's one of our earliest episodes, but also one of our finest when me and King went for our personal top ten lists. Check yeah. it out, by the way. So it's, it's, a, it's a classic slice of, of, of Motorsport 101 there for you. Yeah, um, in, but, in all seven of his full seasons, he, he never finished lower than second place in the championship. God. Damn. And, yeah, yeah, like, five world championships. The other two years, he finished second, so... He could have had seven world championships. See, Mohamed Alfonso is the definition of OP. Right there. Yes, he is OP. And what he did this all starting at the age of, like, 39 was the first world championship season. He was 39 during during 1950. God right. damn. He's, he's still the oldest champion at 46. That record's never going to be broken. Yes. That... Do, you, do you realize how big of a deal was that Michael Schumacher could still go... To some degree, at 42 years old, after yeah. his after his hiatus with his career in Mercedes, dude, we think drivers are washed up at 30. And this dude, Lewis Hamilton, turned 32 last month. <laughs> Take of that what you will. Mm-hmm. Take of that what you will. Okay, next guy on the list, the guy who couldn't beat the man. Everyone thought he might have had the chance to, but Alan Prost. Four-time world Ooh. champion, 51 race wins. That's the thing. Alan Prost had like a 10-year stretch where he was just ridiculous. Like, just Mr. Consistency. Like, either winning the championship or finishing in second. He was that yeah, guy. Yeah. He was, he, the, he he has was his... the ultimate perennial contender. Yeah, <laughs> he has as many runner-up years as he does have championship years. Yeah, and in some of those, and in some of those years, there were years where Alan Prost could have had seven world championships had they counted every result from the season. Oh yeah, that's true because what eighty four? Yeah, eighty four. He lost by half a point to Nicky Lauda, <laughs> as they joked about on Tune. <laughs> <laughs> it was you, you idiot. <laughs> yeah, so if you just like eighty four lost by half a point to Lauda. 88 loses to Senna, but all the races didn't count. If they did count, he would have been champion. So those two years it would have been a completely different story about how great Alan Prost was. Not to mention 51 career wins. The, uh, one of only three drivers in the 50-win club. And that is, again, ridiculous, given they ran a lot less races back then. Um, 16, 15 race seasons compared to the 19, 20, 21 we have now. Like, it's a problem with some of these modern drivers' stats are a little bit inflated for that reason alone, but Prost was a monster of his time. And again, he was the guy in F1 for pretty much a decade. Like, which is crazy given he was in an era that had Ayrton Senna and Nigel Mansell and Nelson, Nelson PK um, in, all in that same era he was competing in. Just, 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 he, he was the guy, and that's yeah. kind of outrageous. And he was one of only a handful of people to retire as world champion. Ah, uh, yes, causing the famous number zero for Damon Hill for the second yes. year in a row. Sup, Nico? Yeah, Botas, why won't you run number zero next year? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. For popularity points right there. Um, and last on, more. on this list, uh, my personal favorite, Rudolph Caracciola. Three-time European Drivers' Champion. No one is, like, the European Championship only lasted seven seasons, so he won three, and no one beat three. And he, he entered 32 major races in his career and won 13 of them. And King, if you try to get him in here, I will suplex you to Kingdom Come. <laughs> <laughs> but he was the guy before Fangio. He was, he, was, he was the man that Fangio had to beat to become the man. And who of the previous four names would you would you leave out to put him in then? Oh dear, that, exactly. that's true. That's true. Like because in my in my opinion, let me get this out. I think we could all unanimously say Michael is in. Yeah, Michael has Definitely. to be in. And I think I can universally say Fangio is in. Yes? Yes. Ooh, right. Almost definitely. Yeah. You know, I would give... I, I said I would put Prost in my first ballot. I would give up Prost if, he ha- if it meant that Fangio and Schumacher had to get in. So that's just me saying it. Yeah. I, 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 I want Prost in. I really do. Because I think Prost doesn't get enough credit for what he did in his F1 career because he was in Ayrton Senna's shadow of popularity for a lot of the time. I mean... F- I mean f- for how long that Senna Schumacher was a thing, it was relatively not that much of his career. I would say at most half. 
Exactly. I mean, and again, people say that Senna beat Prost. They were one on one in their two seasons together. Uh, so That's not really it, true, though. No, no, because not if... really. I know, I know. I'm, I'm being technical here because I know, again, if, if Prost used the more modern scoring system, he would have won because he was the more consistent driver. Um, that, But I, it goes back to my previous argument. If you put Prost in, you can't really not put Senna in and vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's I mean, I mean, they were, they were I w- so important for their time. I, the thing is, I would put Prost in and leave Senna out, but that's just me. <laughs> you would. I mean, d- k- k- King, yeah, King, I are mean- you trying to kill this show? <laughs> <laughs> people like people of Matt's country will come at us with burning pitchforks if we do not put Senna in. No, Although I'm, I totally I'm, I'm agree with sure, you. I mean, I'm not even sure it would even be Matt's country. It would just be your country. <laughs> it would just be you make a bad everywhere. Point there. Even Japan. Japan absolutely loves Senna, so they would come oh, yeah, that's true. fucking oh, murdering you. <laughs> it, 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 it would be the most polite murder of all time. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like, sorry, sorry, I'm really sorry to stab you, but we're going to have to stab you with this pitchfork. Bye. Um, <sighs> yeah, like... See, uh. I, I, see I, I can't not put Senna in because he was so important for how F1 progressed. Like, It was almost like a sacrifice of what he became. And again, it's like the legacy that he's had with Formula One since his death. And don't get me wrong, I think his death is partly responsible for that. But it's just, grr, like, Senna is the embodiment of what people love in a racing driver. And I can't ignore that. But then it leaves me in a really big pickle because I've got to think of five guys I want to put in here. And for me, Schumacher is like Schumacher is my one of my sporting heroes. I can't not put Schumacher in. And I think it's right. safe to say he's in. Fangio okay. is also probably in. Do yeah, we, like, are, we all, are we all unanimously agreed on Prost? Oh my goodness. Uh, um, that's like, not confident, okay, fellas. Okay, okay. Like, <laughs> like I'm, I'm looking at it from the bottom up perspective. I'm like, I'm counting people out. <laughs> Let's see. Like, as much as I like Rudolf Olenhart as a designer, he was a great designer. He was also a great driver. He posted faster times than, than Fangio on a... Co- constant basis but mercedes-benz would not allow him to race under threat of termination because they felt the sport was too unsafe and they didn't want to lose literally the best designer of all time to a car crash Mm -hmm. so i'm counting him out because he could have been the best driver and designer of all time but thanks mercedes-benz for ruining that dream does this does this still hurt you, given how much of a Mercedes fan you actually are, King? Yes, yes, that is probably <laughs> that is probably oh, up man. there with the big Mercedes blunders. <laughs> oh dear! So do we have do so do all of us have our personal uh, top six that are that we are selecting? I do. Uh, I think I've got my six. It's so I do as well. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, yeah, I can scrape together. I, I can. I, I feel confident about my six. <laughs> I feel confident. King, you're the speaker of the house. You go first. Whoa, 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 whoa! You go first. <laughs> <laughs> Me? You're the host. Yeah, All yeah, right. yeah. You were, you were the first to be like, I have my six. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Executive order. You lift your hand first. All right, Michael Schumacher. Okay. One Manuel Fangio. Ayrton Senna, Adam Prost, Sir Jackie Stewart, Colin Chapman. Good six. That's my six. Good six. And let let the record state, I'm so sorry, Jack Brabham, because you were an inch away from getting in. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I've got mine, and trust me, I, I've looked to uh, I've looked to pass Hall of Fame classes for like precedent. Uh, baseball had Ty Cobb, Walter Johnson, Christy Matthewson, Honus Wagner, and Babe Ruth. Uh, NASCAR's Hall of Fame had in their inaugural class Bill France Sr. and Jr., so we kind of wanted to avoid that. Um, so that no sort of burning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. right. No self um, Right. Uh, they had Richard Petty, Dale Earnhardt Sr., and Jr. Johnson, but no David Pearson, which was a bit weird, uh, kind of a bit stupid in my opinion. Um, my six would be Juan Manuel Fangio for being the most successful driver of his decade and possibly for his for the 20th century in sure. terms of outright success and championships. 
Um, it would include Sir Jackie Stewart, who yes. three-time world champion, most successful driver from the United Kingdom of his time. It would include both Alain Prost and Ayrton Senna, who were conjoined at the hip, combined for seven world championships, um, combined for 92 Grand Prix victories, the greatest rivalry, um, whether that's by manufacture, media manufacturing or by what. They had arguably the most memorable rivalry in Formula yeah. One history. Bar Argu- arguably their feud put Formula One on the map. Hmm. Um, I debated about the fifth one between, between Clark or Schumacher because I know... I know there are some people who would who would um, hold Michael Schumacher's transgressions of his prime years uh, against him and leave him off the ballot for that. But you know what? I'd say Schumacher goes in. Schumacher has to go in because, right? He has he owns a lot of statistical records: uh, most wins, most championships, most pole positions, most everything you could think of. Records that will probably stand up for a long period of time. Yeah, like if there's um, if there's a most record, Schumacher probably has it. There's like only one I could find that he didn't have, and that was like most Grand Slams. Jim Clark somehow still has that record. Wow. Right, and again, that's again that's leaving Jim off Jim Clark, who was the most dominant driver of his day. This is always hard. So hard. You got to stick with your choices. And who's I your non, what, and who's your non-driver? I, um. Let's see. If I was voting for it, it would be Colin Chapman just for the amount of technical inf- technical innovation that he brought to the sport. Can I go pee now? <laughs> yes, yes. Just a, I'll you're drop dismissed. My also, six now. Let, let the record show me and RJ had the exact same final six. Oh, yes. Okay, so. Okay, yeah. King, you yeah, want to go first? I'll go with my six, right. yeah. My six, I have to include Michael Schumacher for the previously previously stated reasons. Manuel Manuel Fangio, uh, I'm Colin Chapman. Yeah. I have to I have to put on Dottori Bugatti. I, I just had to. I just had to put on <laughs> nope. Bugatti. No, right, go ahead. Okay, so I have two left, and I'm gonna go Prost and Stewart. No, uh, so there King, is no Senna. You, you're doing this again. You stood like, your ground. I, I admire that. You stood your ground. Yeah, I stood my ground. I said I was. I said I was gonna do it, and I did it. Matt, you do know the reason why that episode in the past was called "You Had Whoever Senna," right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you do know the reason, right? And it made even me nervous because back on that list, and if you don't want to know what that was in the episode, mute your microphone now for the next ten seconds. He put Sebastian Vettel over Ayrton and Senna, and I almost shit myself. Fuck <laughs> off! No way! <laughs> no, even I think that's actually a stupid pick. Really? What the hell? Okay, okay, okay. No, we'll, Vettel we'll have over that. Senna, but like, it's still recent. I see. Thing is. See, the thing is, I don't think it's that stupid a pick. Really? But it's the kind of pick that would piss off so many people. <laughs> yes, it kind of did piss me off right now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we, we call this one the Homer pick, kids. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save that one for off the air. <laughs> but, um, Matt, you're six. Right, so time for my picks. Um, I'm going to go with Fangio. Um, I'm going to mm-hmm. do a little trade over here. I'm going to leave out Jackie Stewart. I'm going to put in Jim Clark. Okay, that's fair. So, and then sure. next come Prost and Senna for the reasons that were argued. If you had to put in one, you have to put in the other. They're conjoined. Um, I'll put in Schumacher as well because of all the great things he's done. He's all the big everything. And for the last one, uh, I'll just go along with everybody else. I'm going to put in Colin Chapman because I've argued for him. I said I would put him in, so I'm also going to stand my ground. I'll put in Colin Chapman. Okay. So, looks like we... <laughs> essentially, we, we did do, it, y'all. Yeah, we, we do have a consensus on who the top six is. Unfortunately, it's not my top six. <laughs> we're, we're agreeing with each other too much. 
I know, on. right? I mean, it's good Wait. to have a little bit of different opinions. It keeps the balance <laughs> of the world, you know. I know, right? That's so just that, that's that's like the justification for Skip Bayless's entire career. <laughs> okay, now now we have our six. Who who would be your seventh? Your try again next year guy on this list? Clark. It would be Jim Clark. Yeah, it's probably Bernie, Eccl- B- Bernie Eccleston. Eccleston, yes. Yeah, Eccleston and Clark. That seemed to be the big. <laughs> Two. Yeah, because I think besides the 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 six that two that that Dre and RJ had was the only change that we had on ours is I had Bugatti, and yeah, I had Bugatti, and you had Clark. Yes. So we we pretty much we have a big consensus, but except for a few little bit changes. Yeah. You pair of hipsters. <laughs> we just want to be different from the more, you know. Just wait until actual Formula One season starts, and we'll then we'll be back to disagreeing with each other again. Sure, yeah, it's like sure. just a month away. Just a month. Just yeah. a month. Just a month. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. the uh, official first ballot of the Motorsport One Hundred and One Mount. What's the name again, King? <laughs> Nivelt. <laughs> What? Nye, yeah, yeah, just, Nye, just, just, just remember, it's like Nye, like Bill Nye, the science guy, and Velt, as in yeah. President Roosevelt. Nye Velt. Yes, yeah. yes, okay. So, our, our, our Mount Nyvelt first ballot of selections to go in are Michael Schumacher, Juan Manuel Fangio, Ayrton Senna, Adam Prost, Sir Jackie Stewart, and Colin Chapman. Congratulations, fellas. We managed to not screw this up like a baseball hall of fame. <laughs> well done, everybody. Just, I'm, just, I'm just waiting for the flood of emails saying, why is Clark not in? <laughs> hey, yeah, I came for him. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get hosted. Yep. <laughs> Don't blame yeah, me. Matt's exonerated in this one. Yeah, Matt's Where's exoner- Rio Harrianto? <laughs> Where's Verstappen, says all our Dutch listeners who exist, really. I'm surprised you people are here. Thanks for being here, though. <laughs> <laughs> King is trying to burn every bridge we have no, left. No, hey, you and guys, not you, many you guys have Verstappen fans listen so to you. How about that Michael Van yeah. Gerwen fella? Our lot of adult song who plays side. darts. Uh, hey, we love Michael um, Van Gerwen. I was going to say, if I have Hamilton fans watching my show, you guys can also have Verstappen fans listening to you. So, Yeah, yeah. that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's very true. That's very true. So, fellas, pat on the back. Job well done. We might even set up a part of the website for that at some point. I'll talk to Steph about that, our website designer at Silver Code. That's not a shameless plug. She's like, she's really fucking good. Go, go oh, check that, her out if you haven't already. That'd be <laughs> that'd be fun because that would involve me writing career biographies for these people. You'd be really good at that, actually, King. Do you, are you down for that, King? Yeah, I'd be down for that. Sweet, I'll send an email. <laughs> right, oh, but but we we do have news before we end. Actually, we do have like a lot of news to get through. Yeah, and a mailbag too. That's the problem. It's right. Like, this is our this is our jam packed diamond episode of Motorsport One Hundred and One. Yeah, well, Thanks for listening this long. Yeah, we're already at something close to two hours and fifteen minutes at this point. So if you're still here. Props to you. I know it plays like a Joe Rogan Experience episode right now, but stick with us. We're nearly there. Motorsport 101 Hold goes on. Mike, this podcast is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> he knows about 12 di- different submission attempts for that position, Mike. That is incredible. It's insane. <laughs> okay, so first up in the news is breaking news at the time of recording that uh, at the Sebring IndyCar test, uh, Smith Peterson will be having a new driver test their car by the name of Pippo Durrani. Lee Stormacher, yeah. <laughs> All the yes. All the yes. I, I, got, no. I, I, have to, I have to say my catchphrase here. Matt, what's up with your mans? <laughs> <laughs> Mickey moves. That would, uh, that would be Louis. That would be Luis Felipe Pippo Durrani, who is getting a test for Schmidt Peterson Motorsport on March the first. Uh, he has some open wheel experience. Last time out was in European Formula Three uh, with Prima Power Team, but he has not driven on an oval since his days in the what is now the Pro Mazda Championship. Yes, it's been awesome. a, it's been a long time, but he's what? What do we say? Do we go the stereotypical? Oh, he's finally home. <laughs> He's he's back where he belongs, dang it. 
Back in the it cell. It belongs again. in yeah. IndyCar. Yeah. Because Elio and TK are going to need successors. Yep. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yes. They, they and, definitely do. And Victor Franzoni doesn't seem to be getting the money to get there. So we'll take what we can get. Think that we can get so good luck to people the Rani. We are um, like imagine him in like a Patron livery style SPM car at the 500. That would oh be mm, delicious. God. That would be I've so- already gotten my hopes up about uh Pastor Maldonado and the uh the now defunct KV racing technology. We were gonna get to that as well. KV, KV are gone, and yeah, that makes me very sad because like they fought so hard to keep themselves together in, in IndyCar and. We got the announcement, I think it was earlier last week, well, late last week, where we got the word that they, they were thanking their fans for all the support, but um, KV they've, is no more. The number 11 is gone. They've already sold all their equipment to Ricardo Junkos and his team, who are trying to make the move up to IndyCar proper after getting through the road of Indy. Um, but yeah, that is that is actually kind of a surprise when you consider that just last year, KV Racing had sponsorship. And we're winning races with Sebastian Bourdais. And three years ago, they won the Indianapolis 500 with Tony Kanaan. Um, that means that now the last team remaining from the unification of uh, Champ Car with the Indy Racing League is Dale Coin Racing. And if you had said this back in 2003 in the, in the glory days of Newman Haas and Forsyth Racing, you would have been laughed at. Yeah. Yeah, like, seriously. <laughs> like, Dale Coyne, what, were midfield at best in Champ Car? Oh, no, they were solid backmarkers. In fact, it's kind of crazy to think that they're actually more successful now than they, uh, than they, were, than they were back when, uh, back in the so-called uh, non-competitive years of that second-rate championship that only produced uh, hacks like Will Power and Simon Paginot and Ryan Hunter Ray and Graham Ray Hall. It's Sebastian Bourdais! You know, yeah, worst four-time champion on the grid in IndyCar. <laughs> as my as my running joke. And we do have some more America news, but in Europe this time. Well, America's yeah, and- news. Well, Prima have announced their Formula 4 drivers this year, and it'll include an American, Juan Manuel Correa, and also a Brazilian with a very familiar last name, Enzo Fittipaldi. Woohoo! Yes. So it should be interesting to see how these youngins do in Formula 4, to see if any of them have the ability for Formula 1. Uh, maybe, you know, skip a step or two up the ladder. Yep. Red Bull Junior Team's also got an American this year in Neil Verhagen. Yes. Yep. Got, got to get the Americans with the foreign names. They're the hot stuff nowadays. Ver- <laughs> Verhagen Watch starts now. <laughs> Verhagen Watch. <laughs> it's going to be really interesting to see how these youngins do. Maybe they can skip a step or two up the ladder, get American in the door real quick. Because, man, it's been a long time since we've... Well, nope, Alex Rossi. Forgot about him. I was about to say... Does he really count, time. though? <laughs> yeah, like, that, that's, that, that, that's kind of a big swing and a miss there, King, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, it's going to be a long time since Scott Speed's been in Formula 1. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since Michael Andretti's been in Formula oh, 1. Oh, God, let's not talk about it. Why hey, is, like, American... He got imagine, a podium I can at least, come that on. There, he got a podium at least. He got fire on the very I can imagine day. that. Yeah, there. I can imagine that there is some American Formula 1 fan who has, like, an old banner of, like, I believe in, and you have all these names crossed <laughs> out, like Michael Andretti, Scott Speed, Alexander Rossi, Connor Daly... And just waiting for Neil Verhagen's name to be, be written on the list. Yep. Probably put Eddie yep, Cheever in there too. And in like Formula One housekeeping news, uh, Williams retained Paul DeResta as the reserve driver. Uh, Nikki Lauda and Toto Wolff signed extensions until 2020. And all is is in Formula One. And but Pascal he, Verline is going to miss his first test. So oh, yeah. Antonio Giovinazzi's going to. Step up and replace him for a bit. Last episode, we talked about racing champions and how Pascal got hurt. Apparently, that injury was worse than originally diagnosed. He has a back injury, so he'll be missing the first test. Oh man, get well soon, Pascal. It looks like it was a lot more nasty than we again when we first predicted. Um, and backs are a nasty when you don't want to do your back in in Formula One uh, as it is, given the neck strain and all that. So, wish him a speedy recovery. Hope he can make the season. Um, in Australia, because as Will Buxton pointed out, these tests are very close together. 
and if he misses one test, could he miss the next one? And if he misses that, could he miss an, end up missing Australia? I mean, they're not they're not all that far apart, really. So uh, who knows? Really, have to wait and see on that one. Yes, have to. And, wait and we've see. all decided that we're going to talk about um, all the new F1 cars, including the new hot pink McLaren MCL32. <laughs> Come again? <laughs> 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 yes, the chartreuse yellow McLaren uh, MCL32. <laughs> yes, yes. At the uh, time of recording, we believe there will be a sharp pink chartreuse on that McLaren. <laughs> Oh, you know, I simmering silver. I, I I'm serious. I just want it to be completely black. And the only the <laughs> single the single orange thing on the car is this little McLaren logo on the nose that only lights up during the night races. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that is your orange, ladies and gentlemen. This is what you've been waiting for, right here. <laughs> Get hype. Get, Get hype. hype. Mailbag to the mailbag. Let me scroll down my page on Twitter real quick and let's find us some stuff. Henry Chapman asks, Who, what would your ideal four car indie car team be? Can only be present day drivers. Mm. Ideal indie car team, present drivers mm. in indie car or anyone. I'll say go with anyone, it's more fun that way because I want Sebastian Vettel, Joseph Newgarden, James Hinchcliffe, and ooh, maybe Daniel Ricciardo. Think of all the merchandise really? I sell. I'm surprised. I'm surprised that you've thought of Daniel Ricciardo because of, of all the bad blood you got with him. <laughs> if he makes me money, I'm willing to let bygones be bygones. <laughs> Sounds f- fair enough. Because uh, I don't. Um, I don't like Ricciardo all that much, but the man sells merch. <laughs> goodness. Um. I'm going with. Uh, I'm going with my boy Joseph Newgarden. Um, who is who's just been delightful ever since he came to Penske, honestly. I'm going with Will Power. I'm going to pick Mikhail mm. Lotion because I like I, I embrace chaos. Mad <laughs> Russian, <laughs> you embrace chaos. Um, and and James Hinchcliffe as well. My team is just uh, my team is a weird amalgamation of Penske and Schmidt Peterson Motorsports. That's all right. Okay, mm-hmm. my team would be. Let's go. Joseph Newgarden, because he just seems to be the box standard pick. And I want that sweet Miller Lite livery. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. I would, yeah, I could go. Newgarden, Kyle Larson. I'd, I'd really like to see Kyle Larson at IndyCar. I, it's not going to happen, but I want it to happen so bad. <laughs> a, a lone Johnson shrieks like a wolf at <laughs> the this message. <laughs> And yeah, usually, usually it's IndyCar guys who go to NASCAR, not the other way around. Sadly, yeah, sadly. Well, Montoya did both the both ways. That is that's true. That's true. Kind of true. And true. my final two, I'd go with uh, Carlos Munoz because he's a solid, at least second place at Indy. Maybe one day he'll get that win. And yeah. last pick, gonna go Connor Daly. Just yeah, Connor Daly. <laughs> Somewhere, Danny Brennan is fist bumping <laughs> right now. Like, yes! Danny and Liz together. <laughs> yeah, just... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Hashtag daily with a four in it. Yeah. Go, go, go on, Matt. Right, so I'm surprised nobody picked this guy, Scott Dixon. Yeah. Sure. So, Scott... Always, uh, always, a, always a safe pick. Yeah. And he can bring his wife to all the press meet. Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so... Oh, I only say that because his, his wife is more popular than he is. That is true. <laughs> if, 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 you look, if you look at Scott Dixon's Instagram, it's not pictures of Scott Dixon. It's 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 the opposite, and um, God bless him for that. <laughs> um, that's all I will say. Um, <laughs> so, I said, Scott Dixon, I'm going to relent my bad blood. Also, I'm going to pick Will Power. Um... I'll go along with everybody else. Oh, safe pick, great. Joseph Newgarden. And for the last one, mm-hmm. uh, I'm going to save some for the home ground, and I'm going to pick, not the one you're thinking of, I'm going to pick Tony Kanaan. 
Tony can ask. Oh, Tony, Tony, yeah, Tony's Tony's solid. Tony's solid. Great character as well. Um, great, great. So, great. so um, you right. So you've heard our picks. So Joseph Newgarden, can you please send us all at least one case of Miller Lite? That'd be very much appreciated. You know, I don't drink alcohol. Send me the fridge instead. That would <laughs> be really fridge. cool to have in the bedroom. Uh, uh, in that like, case, it, just it, send me Drace pack. I'll take two. <laughs> He'll take two. Sure. He'll take two. We're all look, just just imagine that podcast of a sweet can of Miller Lite. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, yes. There's a shout out to New Garden who actually tweeted the podcast last week. <laughs> and I a- told y'all. I told y'all. <laughs> <laughs> We're in. We are so in there with Joseph Newgarden. Now, he, he has to win the IndyCar series now. We are all officially Team Newgarden. Because Newgarden endorsed the podcast. And a friend of you've Newgarden got the time, Andre's got the podcast. Yes, sir. <laughs> I like this already. Right. Uh, who said Romo asks, question for King. Would you rather be able to choose the next United States president or the next 20 Formula One and IndyCar champions? Oh, I know I could affect great change in the sport if I could pick the next 20 champions in both series. But That's a terrifying thought now I think about yeah, it. Yeah, you, like, you, <laughs> you realize how much you could change. Like, let's say I want, you know, somehow Pascal Verlein to be a two-time world champion at Sauber. That would completely change Sauber's standing within Formula 1, both financially and competitively. <laughs> You'd bankrupt Haas, you devil! <laughs> <laughs> but nah, as, as, as sweet as that deal sounds, to have Connor Daly as a three-time IndyCar champion, I'm going to have to go oh. pick the next American president. I'm sorry. That is... You're no fun! <laughs> we ha- but we have more pressing needs. <laughs> we have- Our needs ain't been met. <laughs> <laughs> it's for the greater good, Ray. It's for the greater good. Oh, the greater damn good. him! He's wrong, he's wrong. I want Sebastian Vettel to win 10 world titles, damn it! <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm selfish, what can I say? Len asks, if you could have an F1 race in any city, where would it be? In brackets, Baku doesn't count. <laughs> damn it! Well done. <laughs> Baku welcomed us all. They welcomed us. But they were, <laughs> but they were so welcoming, Len. I mean... <laughs> Mm, oh, God, I, I don't want to go I'm first because I'm so biased because I live in a city. <laughs> to be fair, I would love to see a Formula One race in New York as well. I really would. Yeah, it's it's just oh we we tried it. Yeah, whatever happened to Port Imperial, not... right? Oh yeah, that that was the second time Bernie tried it, and uh, things happened. It's okay. You'll you'll have Gran Turismo four in the Forza series. It's fine. <laughs> It's the, it's, they took out New York from Forza. <laughs> oh, God damn it. We can't even get virtual Ugh. races anymore. We'll, we'll always have our factor, King. We'll always have our factor. <laughs> so, your guys' picks? Um, oh, buddy. I'm going with the city of... I gotta be on brand, say Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. They, oh, they the almost got sake. an Ypres that inaugural season almost yeah i know i'm still mad about it and and and, like... and they almost had a super bowl too but look, look <laughs> oh where we are <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, wow. yeah, I mean that that is just kind of on brand for atlanta really hey it's a good <laughs> thing the thrashers are still oh, no well <laughs> i think we can all go down for a baseball game ah shit yeah <laughs> <laughs> Matt, and, and anything from you? Uh, Curitiba, Brazil, No, maybe? I think Curitiba <laughs> is a bit too tight to have a... Well, not only is it tight, it's very hilly because we live in, like, the top of a peak in here, so it wouldn't be whoa, very whoa, good. Whoa, 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 uh, whoa, whoa, calm down. You're, you're making some diehard fans really want that to happen now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. His hometown uh, is too busy praising Anderson Silver all day, so... <laughs> well, you're going to have to keep it in your hearts and in your minds because I don't think it's viable. And I live in the city, so I know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> the Sao Paulo did. track from Indy looked kind of good from what it, from the few races that I've seen. So yeah. I guess that would be a viable one if Interlagos yeah. was ever to be scrapped. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the only reason why that Sao Paulo street race happened because apparently Formula 1 has a, like a non... like. But their circuits, they're not allowed to host IndyCar. Uh, Thanks, Formula One. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Bernie. 
Thanks, Bernie. I mean, we we got solid street circuit out of it, so not too much to hate about that, I guess. <laughs> In, indeed. Speaking of uh, certain track-related discussions, Owen from Vote Mayor Quimby asks... That's, like, that's, that's still one of the best Twitter usernames I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> do you think MotoGP should go to Spa? MotoGP had gone to Spa, believe it or not. When was this? When was the last Belgian um, motorcycle? I'm pretty sure it was a was... long time ago. I, I've seen no, it, I've seen footage from that once, but it was a quite a long time ago. I think it was in the yeah, mid eighties. Yeah, the last Belgian motorcycle Grand Prix was nineteen ninety. They had oh. raced there from the inaugural season, nineteen forty nine and up until nineteen ninety. Then it got dropped. Yeah, I cannot imagine uh, current spot for Anchor Shop will be good for MotoGP, especially considering that the new bus stop chicane is kind of a mess. Yeah, and but I mean, I guess I guess if the Red Bull ring can work, why not? I think the problem that's, is that's the thing; it didn't really work because it was so broken for Chicassi in the first place. I, I think <laughs> the main issue would be Radalon, where it it where it crosses back over a, on itself. It's a high speed uphill corner. That crosses back over on itself. So if you fall on the bike, you're gonna go straight into the path of oncoming motorcycles. I think they would have Yikes. to make some changes to that one, like not make it cross over, but more like a little kink, another one, and then just go yeah. straight instead of making the whole turn thing. Because uh, the bikes don't have enough the, the enough downforce to make that turn. I think. Yeah. Mhm. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that sounds covered. Um. <laughs> let's have a look here. Um, Josh Shuttle asks for the next major F1 regulation revamp would you majorly change the engines or the aero uh, well. I mean if it, if we're stuck with the restriction of ore it's so hard like if I I would like completely burn the rule book in like the middle of FIA headquarters before we redid this thing because that is how broken everything is right now <laughs> I want to see that. I, I, I want King to come in with a flag, and on the flag is the rule book, and just needs to burn it in front of Jean Tot's face while waving it. So if that happens, I will die a happy man. <laughs> but yeah, but, um, I'd probably arrow first. Arrow first. Yep, same. I'm I'm an engine guy. I think I think they should go engines first for me because the engines are the stem of what's caused all these fucking issues. First of all, but um, you know with the, with the sport uh, economically, I think it's also kind of screwy, and that's because these engines are twice as expensive. That is true. Um, so, so for me, I would go engines first for the sake of ec- short term economic health benefits. I'd probably go with that over the aero. Because I mean, we've had shitty aero in F1 for the majority of the last fifteen years. This is nothing new. Yeah, so I, I, I really, talk. I really think as as much as I like we talked about it earlier. I, like I love the designers that this sport has had. We really need ballast, like seriously. <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, that's probably not a bad shout. Um, for the so F one asks, what are your thoughts of Lando Norris brackets, or is it too early to tell? <laughs> um, I definitely think he's on the right track to be um, the next great British F one driver. Um, he's won a bunch of titles in formula four um had he won a couple of euro uh formula Renault titles the past season um somehow s- follows me on twitter for oh, wow. reasons so re- for reasons i'm not entirely sure i don't even know if this is still true or not um but lando's got some real talent and i believe if he can string it all together get that budget behind him um it will not be long before you see him in a formula one car I believe he's doing European F3 this season, and that's looking like a pretty stacked class, even if there's not a whole lot of people in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting, because I know he's going to be at Carlin next year. So let's Mm -hmm. let's hope he stays on the route to Formula One, because he could be the next big Brit here in the States in IndyCar. Just like Jax Hawksworth and James Jakes. Um, <laughs> hype. No, I'm joking. That's harsh. Hype. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's hype. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that next year in Formula 3 is going to be interesting for him because, like, probably if I had, like, a boy driver in Junior Series, it's Lando's teammate. It's the Archduke himself for Nan Hapsburg. <laughs> Oh, the Archduke. <laughs> yes. <laughs> King's got to have all the jokes throughout this calendar year, which is a funny thing because we did also get asked from Shawnee, how often will you cover GP2 and GP3? 
I will try and make an effort to watch more of it this year. Because, like, the times I did watch it, it was actually pretty darn good. Like in Monza. Um, like, Monza was great, for example. Bahrain was entertaining. Like, I will promise I will get into a habit of mentioning GP2 and trying to watch it more and getting it on the podcast. GP3 might be a bit too far for me, but we'll see. I, I will definitely try to get more GP2 in there because, again, the series looked really promising last year, but no one's in F1. Oh, yeah, I just... Super Formula. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Japanese boy. Time <laughs> zones, man. Time zones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, GP2 should be interesting. It's most the same guys from last year, so... <laughs> For better or worse, it makes GP2 entertaining, at least. Absolutely. Let me just pull up the Facebook for just a second. And Nick Higgins asks, What are your thoughts on newcomer KTM slash Red Bull's bike for MotoGP? And do you think they will do well? That livery is quality too. For Let the record state, I do not like that KTM livery at all. I, l- um, I love it. It's a child me. It's <laughs> <laughs> You're a KTM it's... fanboy to the bone. You know, that, like that that livery was peak KTM. Of course, you'd love it. It's orange, so it's automatically good. Yeah, but it's also Red Bull. It's also Red Bull matte. Yeah. It's like that same design that they've got in F1 and supercars. It's everywhere. I don't now. like it's, it. It's the new. I, trend. I don't like the. I don't like the red, orange, and yellow in there. I just think ugh, it, it doesn't really work for me. Um, rarely do I agree with Zara Daniela on fashion on this one, but I'm actually in her camp on this one. Um, I'm not a big fan of the livery. How well will they, will they perform? Well, they've got two really good riders in Bradley Smith and Paul Despagaro, uh, probably the two best independent riders in the sport, um, certainly in terms of consistency, for sure. Um, whether, they, whether them and their treadless chassis will work in the long run, remains to be seen yeah it's i think even me as a diehard fanboy it's gonna be a really hard sell it's gonna be a really hard sell yeah i think it's gonna be a matter of year two might be the big year because suzuki it, w- it was year two they, where they made the big step forward and they turned themselves from you know top eight to podiums and, and a race win for maverick vinale so i think the uh, thing is ktm looked in a better spot when they're debuting now than when Suzuki made their return two years ago. So that is actually kind of promising. I think those I think they'll be regular point scorers, which again it's not that hard to do given it's a top fifteen score points in in MotoGP, but I think they'll be the weakest of the factory teams to start us off. But I think they will climb up there. If they if KTM are really going in balls deep on this one, then I think they'll I think they'll do quite well in the in the medium to long term, I think. Maybe just not right away. Um, Though Brian one, Lennon, one I, thing I have to do mention about KTM that I don't disagree with, where CEO uh, Stefan Petter, Petterer has said that Honda was KTM's most hated competitor. The, 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 that's their Moto3 beef right there, because they accused Honda of running illegally a high RPM settings a couple of years ago. That's where that stems from. So that's because obviously in Moto in Moto3 it's been KTM versus Honda for a good few years now fighting out with their representative factory teams and of course the Red Bull KTM and the IO branch are going to hate Honda's guts for those very reasons alone because guys like Alex Marquez won championships on them so uh, yeah we'll have to wait and see how that plays out but uh, KTM have no problem throwing the shade at people like like we saw at Honda and like we saw with Jorge Lorenzo when the Ducati move was first announced he said I don't know why Ducati have spent 12 million euros a year to get a guy that can't ride in the wet. <laughs> Des- oh, damn. Describing- listen, to bi- listen to Bike Live every week, now part of the Motorsport 101 network. Yay! Cha-ching. I probably Thanks. won't be on the show often because I am, as Dre said, a KTM fanboy. <laughs> We're just going to end up beating you down every <laughs> single week, King. <laughs> or likely. Um... One more question from Brian Glennon on the Facebook page. Um, it's, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because we're running short on time. But he says, "Do do they do because Monster now own NASCAR's NASCAR Cup Series? Do you see them trying to kick out other soft drinks out of the sport like Mountain Dew, Rockstar, etc., or, or like Red Bull, for example? Uh, Mountain no, Dew wouldn't like fall in that category because it's like a different brand. Mountain Dew is just soft drinks and not an energy drink, so yeah. I think Mountain Dew is safe." But yeah, the, they don't have anything to worry about because Red Bull is not coming back to NASCAR anytime no. soon. 
<laughs> not without a change of ownership, they're not. Um, five Hour Energy, uh, they're not even in the same category, although they love to market themselves against each other for whatever reason, even though one is more like an, a, a supplement and one is like a soft drink. I don't even know. It's, it's all about punching um, up, I, you know? You have to get it to the competition's head. Yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> Yep, and I think that will just about do it for what I believe is the longest episode of the Motorsport 101 podcast we have ever done. We're already over two hours and 40 minutes. Um, just like to say thank you for supporting us as always. We've done 75 of these damn episodes now. It's been pretty chaotic to say the least. Um, but it's it's it, we, we continue to really enjoy this ride and I, hope, I just hope you guys continue to enjoy the show and well now with two shows on the network it's incredible i know before we get to this position and um yeah please keep supporting us i hope you guys continue to enjoy what we put out there in terms of video content podcasts and just my really shitty tweets on social media um but if you if you if you survive this long you're probably here for life now so god bless you um <laughs> Aww. Um, of course special thanks to everyone that's, that's helped support the series as well to this point you guys know who you are I'll be here for another 15 minutes if I had to run through them all but you guys know who you are and don't let it, don't think you're not appreciated because you are you guys are fantastic and you guys just want to see us do well and that is always an incredibly selfless and powerful thing so thank you everybody for 75 episodes um, the diamond is complete sadly it's no longer in the rough but uh here we are um thanks to everybody that listened um just before we go matt plug yourself real quick oh yes this past monday chris and i chris cook and i have released the proper first episode of our podcast the cooking carnero show where we talk about all kinds of stuff but mostly music we do our own little reviews about albums and stuff um we ask the questions from the crowd and we just talk about stuff in general so yeah, you can check it out on Chris's channel, youtube.com slash user slash cookproductions1. And yeah, this is it. Hope you watch it. Yeah, if you're into your music, absolute must listen because Cook and Matt go through music like I go through hot dinners. Um, they, they are fantastic when it comes to music. And Cook already promised I would go on there at some point to talk about Robot Wars. So <laughs> yeah, you can, you, can, you can look forward yeah, to that I'm just one. Gonna be, I'm just going to be completely silent for that one. Just... Just letting it out there. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to nerd out in the corner of the room and just completely ruin Matt's night, <laughs> um, basically. Um, but again, another podcast to welcome into the Brethren, so to speak. Um, so again, I wish him all the best. Again, I, I had a quick listen to a, about half the show before we started taping. This is great. Go out of your way to see it. And, you know, we all know Chris and Matt are great guys and, uh, you know, well worth a listen. Uh RJ, tell us about Super GT World real quick. Super GT World um, news, updates, commentary on the Autoback Super GT series and other series in Japan. Follow it at Super GT World on Twitter. Um, I'm actually working on a whole new project. Um, taking the David Heinemeyer Hansen method of ranking drivers by their top 20 fastest lap averages and doing that for, ev- for seven out of eight rounds that I missed last season. Because I managed to find on Super GT's mobile website, which is only accessible on iOS devices, uh, that they keep all this information on every lap that the driver ever did during every race of the season. Mm. I swear, I, I've lost an entire day just doing one of these alone. Holy shit, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? <laughs> so check it out, it's fun, y'all. We need, we need to get RJ a partner at some point, really, because he, he doesn't deserve to go through this pain um, for, our, for our entertainment. Um, you know where to find me and King, and, and you know, I'm Harrison101HD on Twitter. Um, again, we're getting the season reviews out of the way. If you've ever seen my whiteboard of, of thoughts, I can finally tick Bike Live Season 4 off the list because that is now done and sorted, and that's now well underway. I've got a Ride 2 Dre view coming out probably in the next couple of weeks once I play it a bit more to refresh myself and start writing up that review. 
And I'm considering doing a Katie Fairman and doing a running diary throughout throughout March, maybe one post a day, just talking about random stuff from over sport and maybe other sports in general about the Grand Tour because I've, I've kind of given up reviewing that episode by episode because I just don't want to go through that twice. <laughs> but um, I might do an overall retrospe- retrospective of the series as well. So I've got, I've got all sorts of thoughts going on there, but I will definitely be dedicating March and April to longer projects of writing hashtag the kick that's all i will say for now but um you, you know where to find us all really again facebook.com forward slash motorsport 101 twitter and motorsport underscore 101 youtube.com forward slash motorsport 101 and our website the motorsport 101.net and of course our personal twitters at harrison 101 hd at ryan eric king with two k's at rj o'connell and at skelling tour thank you very much for listening over the last 75 episodes you crazy chickens and we'll catch you probably in a couple of weeks time maybe next week, who knows, for another episode. And of course, be sure to check out Bike Live as well if you haven't already. I've been Andre Harris. Thank you very much for listening. And I'll catch you guys next time. Sayonara. <laughs>